I will now take roll. Ms. Cohen. Here. Ms. Corbett Sanders. Good evening. Ms. Erna Koufax. Good evening. Mr. Frisch. Hello. Ms. Keys Gamara. Ms. McLaughlin. Here. Ms. Marin. Good evening. Ms. Omesh. Good evening. Ms. Bukarski. Good evening. Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Good evening. Ms. Tolan. Hello. Thank you. Mr. Anabudo. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, all. Please rise as our student representative, Nathan Anabudo, leads us in the reciting of the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. In order to comply with section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia, it is necessary for the board to certify that since the Fairfax County School Board convened a closed meeting on March 18, 2021, and to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed session were heard, discussed, or considered by the board during the closed session. That is moved by Ms. Omesh, seconded by Ms. Corbett Sanders. All in favor? Ms. Ms. Eismo Heiser, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Marin, Ms. Omesh, Ms. McLaughlin, Mr. Frisch, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Darnock Koufax, Ms. Tolan, and myself. And Ms. Corbett, and Ms. Keys Gamaro will be joining us in, uh, very shortly. If you would like to review a copy of the agenda and any agenda item that is being discussed tonight, that information may be found at the back of the auditorium or on the website at fcps.edu slash school board slash board docs. Tonight's meeting is being broadcast on channel 99 and live streamed on the website at fcps.edu slash tv slash ch99. Item 5.02, item 5 Award of Contract to Northern Virginia Community College Pathway to Baccalaureate Program has been removed from tonight's agenda. The program will now be offered free of charge this year, so we want to thank our partners at Northern Virginia Community College. We would like to welcome a few special guests from the City of Fairfax Schools who are joining us virtually this evening. Superintendent Dr. Phyllis Pajardo, please say hello. Good evening, thank you for having us. Thank you. School Board Chair, Ms. Carolyn Pitches. Ms. Pitches, we'll get to you in a little while. Vice Chair, Dr. Mitch Sutterfield. Hello, good evening. Good evening. And Board Member, Ms. Toby Sorensen. We are glad that you're with us this evening as we recognize the National Board Certified Teachers. I'm now calling Mr. Anabudo for a few announcements. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. I only have the one for tonight, and that is Mathematics and Statistics Awareness Month is April 2021. April is Mathematics and Statistics Awareness Month marks a time to increase the understanding and appreciation of mathematics and statistics. Why? Both subjects play a significant role in addressing many real world problems, such as internet security, sustainability, disease, climate change, the data deluge, and much more. Research in these and other areas is ongoing, revealing new results and applications every day in fields such as medicine, manufacturing, energy, biotech, and business. Mathematics and statistics are important drivers of innovation in our technological world, in which new systems and methodologies continue to become 
more and more complex. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anabuto. Item 2.05, National Board Certified Teachers Recognition. Tonight, we are pleased to honor the Fairfax County Public School teachers who have earned or renewed National Board Certification. The teachers we are honoring represent every district, every region, and at all levels in Fairfax County Public Schools. It is my great, and now I, it is my great honor on behalf of the Fairfax County School Board to recognize the dedication and contributions of our National Board Certified Teachers to the education of our students. Now, I would like to invite our Division Superintendent, Dr. Braybrand, to make some additional remarks. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, uh, and thank you, members of the school board. Uh, I'm so proud this evening to highlight the contributions and impact of our National Board Certified Teachers to our teachers. I want to offer my sincere thanks to each of you for your deep commitment to our students and ensuring each child has what they need to feel connected to school, connected to you, and connected to the learning over this past year. We would not be where we are today without the enduring commitment of our teachers to deliver high quality instruction and engage students in meaningful learning, whether it's virtual, whether it's concurrent, or whether it is in person. For some of you, this recognition is coming a year late. I know that as the planned ceremony was in last March and it was canceled due to the shutdown related to COVID-19. But we are here now to celebrate you appropriately and I appreciate all that you have done to keep the focus on students this past year. To all of you, thank you. I do want to highlight and recognize your commitment to professional growth, the certification and the maintenance of the certification requires a commitment, a personal commitment to pursuing professional development, implementing the learning in the classroom and studying its impact on student learning. And I know the national board process is rigorous, time consuming and highly reflective. As reflective practitioners, you all have enhanced instruction, developed advanced teaching knowledge and continuously implemented best instructional uh, practices. All of which lead, uh, lead to achieving our goal of the FCPS portrait of a graduate. Your impact on student learning is unmatched. Congratulations to all of the new and renewed National Board Certified Teachers. Thank you again for all that you do. And Dr. Anderson, members of the board and community, I want you to take just a few moments here to introduce to you teachers who've achieved a renewed National Board Certification. We have a short video to share with you all. Let's watch. My name is Sandra Jenkins, and I achieved my National Board Certification in Adolescent and Language Arts. Thank you for inviting me to speak on the importance of the process of obtaining a National Board Certificate in Teaching. Teaching full-time and completing all four components would not have been possible without the support of the County's Academy course, my candidate support provider, my students, co-workers, and of course my husband. This experience has also driven me to become an advocate for students and their needs both in the classroom and for their future. I have branched out in my understanding of the inner workings of different departments and the larger picture of professional needs that trickle down and impact our students every day. To say this process has changed how I think about how schools operate is an understatement. I am now able to use my knowledge and networking to help my students access services and curriculum that I previously didn't even know were available. My student relationships have deepened as a result because many of them now know that they can turn to me to guide them towards a solution for the issues they may be experiencing both in and out of the classroom. I truly believe this is what made the difference with my students and my practice. The ability to find where students were struggling beyond the curriculum, reflect, and use that to help them vocalize that struggle through their work to achieve their educational and personal goals. These struggles became our fuel in class and allowed for my students to become more self-aware and reflective, which allowed for them to produce some of their best work as I myself became more and more engaged with my own self-reflection and developed lessons that I knew would help them understand the curriculum and drive home their development into well-rounded people. Overall, I feel like achieving the certification and joining the elite collection of National Board Certified Teachers is a renewal of my teaching career. I am hungry to grow and learn in order to continue to make students into better people through my own reflections and growth. 
I highly recommend that every educator goes through this process of obtaining their national board certification as it will truly change how you view teaching. Thank you and best of luck to the 2021 candidates. Hello everyone, Ron Rogers. I'm the proud principal at Mount Vernon High School. I became national board certified over 17 years ago when I was a fifth grade teacher at Riverside Elementary School right across the street from Mount Vernon. Going through this process was one of the most reflective and rigorous experiences I've ever had in my entire career. And as an administrator, and especially during this pandemic, it is so important for us to think differently about how we do business. We must ensure that what we are doing is having an impact on our students, both academically and supporting their social emotional well-being. Well, for teachers who've gone through the national board process, this is not a new idea. They have really done a great job to ensure that students are actively engaged, that their students are engaged in activities that are student-centered, that they're experiencing things that are their choice, and that they are constantly reflecting on what's working and what they might do to make things even better. In short, the National Board Certification process prepares our teachers for whatever comes their way. The skills and dispositions they learn through this process are applicable to everything that we do. This learning is invaluable and I am honored to have so many National Board Certified teachers at Mount Vernon. Congratulations to all of you tonight. You will be better as a result of the experience of going through this process. My name is Emily Zarbininski and I'm a National Board candidate this year. My interest in National Board actually began about 20 years ago when I was student teaching. So this has actually been a career long goal for me to certify. My cooperating teacher had um, certified the year I was with her. And to this day, I hold myself to a standard of teaching. I really think she inspired in me. She just had such an amazing connection with her students and really pushed them to think at, at greater depths than independently. And these are all things I strive to do with my own students. Throughout this process, um, which I started about a year ago, um, I did one component last year, I'm doing a second component this year. Throughout this process, I've, I've really focused on being a more reflective practitioner and paying attention to the details of what National Board is asking you to do. So a lot of things that I think I do sort of normally and naturally, I'm learning to really articulate um, and, ex and be intentional about explaining why I do the things that I'm doing. I'm learning a lot about myself as a teacher and as a person and as a student um, in terms of what I want to say and being able to say it in, in the best way possible. We truly are thankful for the continued investment the school board has made in the professional growth of its teachers. And I also want to thank the City of Fairfax School Board, including the Superintendent, Dr. Phyllis Pajardo, for her advocacy and the board's advocacy at the City of Fairfax to elevate the National Board certification process in city schools uh, and for those who seek and achieve the certification. Our sincere thanks, too, to the uh, Office of Professional Learning and Family Engagement for their support of teachers in their journey to achievement at National Board. And then thank you again uh, members of the school board tonight and this community for allowing us to highlight this extraordinary group of educational professionals this evening. Now more than ever, it's more important than ever to recognize our teachers and all they are doing to support our students. And national board teachers are a true role model for all of us here in Fairfax County Public Schools and across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Braybrand. I would be remiss if I didn't take a minute to um, highlight the work of these individuals. As a former teacher and principal, I know firsthand the rigor of the preparation to become a nationally board certified teacher. It was one of my goals as a teacher. And this elite group of educators who have put themselves in the position to really extend their education just continues to support the elite and wonderful school system that we have here in Fairfax County. So thank you to all of those teachers who have taken the additional time to prepare themselves to continue to push and 
re and have our students reach excellence, excellence in Fairfax County. This is a wonderful opportunity. And I encourage any other teacher who is interested to partake in this, but it is a rigorous process. And I'm so proud that so many of our teachers have been successful in completing it. Thank you, Dr. Brabrand. Fairfax County City School Board members, if you would like to speak on this matter, you are invited to do so at this time. I'm sorry, Fairfax City School Board members. Dr. Anderson and Dr. Brabrand, if I may. Yes, please, Dr. Pajardo. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity to celebrate uh, the wonderful teachers throughout the county and in the city of Fairfax as well. On behalf of the city board, I extend a congratulations uh, to the teachers and to the folks who have renewed. It further shows their uh, commitment and their uh, focus on uh, reflective practices and improving themselves so that they can be even stronger teachers for our exceptional students. Thank you again for uh, inviting us and we celebrate with you and the teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Anderson? Yes, please go ahead, Dr. Sutterfield. Oh, yes. Well, I'm just uh, uh, so enthusiastic about this program. I have been for years. We have a half a dozen uh, teachers from our city, you know, that have, we obviously are partners with the county, but our, our city schools are, have six teachers that have done that and uh, one renewal. So we're really happy to participate in this program and we'll continue to contribute uh, to the healthy development of this program. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the Fairfax City Board would like to speak to this? Thank you. Now I will invite our members if they'd like to speak. Ms. Keys, I'm sorry, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Yes, thank you, Dr. Anderson. I too want to congratulate all those that have uh, received their National Board certification and those who have been recertified. This is truly a remarkable success and an achievement that I am just in awe of. As uh, Dr. Uh, Rogers said, you know, this is something that once a teacher embarks upon this uh, level of rigor in their uh, academic pursuits, they, they continue with it. So it's been 17 years since she got her initial certification and uh, then she went through not only teaching at the elementary school level, but being a principal at the elementary and now at the high school level. And what I hear all the time from our community is the um, innovation and the inquisitiveness that comes from our uh, National Board certified teachers and the effective modeling they do as best in class is so important. And so I just, applaud you and am in awe, so thank you. Thank you. Seeing that there are no other speakers, thank you again, Dr. Brabrand, for this wonderful presentation and congratulations to all of the teachers. <laughs> Item 2.06, resolution of Fairfax County School Board to condemn anti-Asian racism and commit to action. I call on Ms. Pekarski for the resolution. Thank you. Whereas since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, <clears throat> racial shunning harassment, discrimination, violence, threats of violence, and acts of discrimination targeting Asian and Asian American community, particularly impacting women, children, seniors, and Asian-owned businesses have increased throughout the country by 150% over the past year, resulting in the tragic loss of life in Atlanta this week. And whereas Fairfax County Public Schools has over 184,000 students and almost 20% identify as Asian, Asian American or Asian Pacific Islander, Fairfax County Public Schools is committed to global citizenship and a caring culture, where all students and staff deserve access to the benefits of a public education without fear of hate-based violence in the classroom, stands against the hate and bigotry against all our students, staff, 
families, and community. And whereas, Fairfax County Public Schools maintains and enforces a racial equity policy, gender inclusion policy, an equal opportunity non-discrimination policy, an anti-bullying policy, and, I, and an anti-harassment discrimination violence and retaliation policy, which are applicable to the entire district community by way of incorporation into staff expectations and the student rights and responsibilities handbook. And whereas the school system provides educators with the expectations, resources, and support to provide instruction to students in digital citizenship, bullying prevention, and specific lessons on coronavirus stereotypes, fears, and racism, and will continue to commit resources to educate its employees and identify resources to ensure curriculum and equity trainings are inclusive of Asian and API communities, and whereas the Fairfax County Public School continues to engage in outreach to members of the AAPI community to explain how to file a complaint of discrimination with FCPS and encourage these communities to utilize the resources um, for anyone who has been discriminated against in Fairfax County Public Schools. Therefore, be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board condemns violence and discrimination targeting the Asian and Asian American community and rejects any language that associates the ongoing public health crisis with a particular national or ethnic group, recognizing that discriminatory language is counterproductive to defeating a virus that observes no national or ethnic boundaries, and be it resolved that the school board reaffirms and proactively implements all policies, practices, and procedures, including working with the public and private institutions and organizations working to address, to address xenophobia and racism to ensure that our AAPI students, staff, families, and community are not subjected to bias, harassment, discrimination, violence, or retaliation. Is there a second? Ms. Corbett Sanders, thank you. Ms. Pekarsky, would you like to speak to your resolution? Yeah, very quickly. I know that was a long resolution, and it, it is with a heavy heart that it is offered tonight. Um, in Fairfax County, and specifically in the Sully District, which I represent, our Asian American and Pacific Islanders are our student staff, neighbors, and our friends. They are a valued part of the social and economic fabric of our communities. I know my colleagues will join me in strongly condemning these acts of violence tonight that we have seen in Atlanta, across the United States, and even in our own backyard in this county when AAPI-owned local businesses were targeted and burglarized just a few weeks ago. Fairfax County Public Schools is a place that welcomes all. We are a great place to learn in large part because of our diverse student body. It is our greatest strength and um, hate and bigotry have no place in our school system or in our community. We all have an obligation to stand up and speak up for our neighbors and friends. And I urge everyone to speak to their children about the damage of hurtful words, whether they are spoken or through a screen that can, that, um, can hurt others. And I call our, on our entire Fairfax County community to join us and do your part to stop Asian hate. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Pekarski. Ms. Corbett Sanders, would you like to speak to your second? Yes, I'll be very brief because Ms. Pekarski was so eloquent. I ask as a plea to not only my colleagues, but all of our community, that now is the time to be reaching out to our members of the Asian community. Show them, patronize their businesses, show them that we are here for them and that we don't believe that there is any role for hate in our community. And the way to do that is to be very proactive. Similarly, with our students in our virtual and in our physical classrooms, making sure that we reach out and that we are there for a community that has been very negatively impacted by stereotypes that are unacceptable in our community. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Any other school board members wishing to speak on this matter? Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Thank you. I will be brief as I have something fairly lengthy to share later. Um, as an Asian American myself, um, 
I, I know just from my own experiences that often hate against Asian Americans goes uncalled and unnoticed. And, um, and we're seeing that now. And we're seeing the fact that words matter and hateful words matter. And for the last year, we have let words that have targeted a community often go unchecked. And those words have now led to violence and have been leading to violence and we're finally calling attention to it. So I, I ask that we all go out in this world that's so divided with the action of coming together. And I ask we do it with the mentality and the thought of what happens to one of us happens to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Eisma Heiser. Ms. Omeish? Thank you. Uh, I wanted to make sure I, I did speak to this and lend my support, no doubt. Um, you know, in our community, we have 20% of our FCPS family uh, that is of an Asian background, and, and that is, you know, one in five. Um, I, I wanted to particularly highlight, you know, the importance of one piece that, that Ms. Pekarsky mentioned, which is generalization, and that being what led us here. The fact that, you know, a, a joke that we think we can just drop here and there, a comment that's made in passing that we don't call out, that we don't question, that we don't hold one another accountable to, is how we end up seeing levels of violence. It's, it's actually, uh, sometimes it's difficult to see the connection between these things, but over time, as we dehumanize the other, as we generalize uh, even subconsciously and assuming what folks might be about or associating different things. That stuff takes proactive work on our end uh, to really correct. And, and you know, last meeting, we, I presented an equity resolution. This is uh, uh, an, an example of what I was trying to speak to, where that work starts with ourselves. So the best way we can show this kind of support, no doubt, is to demonstrate that solidarity, as my colleagues have shared, but to constantly question our own assumptions and correct the ills that may be within us. Uh, in how we understand our neighbors and friends. Thank you, Ms. Omeish. Ms. Tolan? Yes, good evening. Um, I would be remiss at not saying something given the uh, many neighbors in the Drainsville district um, that are in our Asian community. Um, absolutely, there is no place for discrimination in our neighborhoods and in our schools. Um, I would encourage um, everyone to participate in the uh, wonderful programs that our schools are doing around diversity, um, equity, and inclusion. And, um, you know, have these important discussions within your family so that we can ensure that all of our students feel, feel welcome in our schools and that our, um, our Asian neighbors feel welcome in our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Ms. Cohen. Thank you, and I appreciate uh, Ms. Pekarski bringing this resolution. You know, I think that what we have seen here in our own community um, is just an awful lot of ugly, and I think we're seeing it all over the country, and we've even seen it in our schools in this short time that we have been back together of anti-AAPI, anti-Muslim, um, anti-Semitism, and we got to own it and we got to work to make sure that we take steps in every direction, meaningful steps to ensure that we're not just talking the talk, but make sure that we're walking the walk. And um, I'm grateful for this resolution and I hope that it is some kind of balm to a community that is um, really hurting right now. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Seeing that there are no other speakers, I will now call for the vote. All in favor of this resolution, please raise your hands. Ms. McLaughlin, Mr. Frisch, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Sizemore Heiser, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Marin, Ms. Omeish, Ms. Darna Koufax, Ms. Tolan, and myself. That is 11, and that is unanimous for our attendance this evening. I'll now call on Ms. Sizemore Heiser for the recognition for Autism Awareness Month. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. April is National Autism Awareness Month, and the 14th annual World Autism Awareness Day is April 2nd. 
Autism is a complex developmental disability that affects an individual's social interaction and communication skills. It is known as a spectrum disorder because each child is different and affected in unique ways, with many strengths and challenges. Students with autism attend many of our schools in Fairfax County. The Autism Society of America recognizes that the prevalence of autism in the United States has risen from one in 125 children in 2010 to one in 59 in 2020. National Autism Awareness Month provides an opportunity for friends, families, and local communities to increase awareness and acceptance of autism and celebrate the unique aspects and talents of all people. The Autism Society's Celebrate Differences campaign, which focuses on providing information and resources for communities to be more aware of autism, promote acceptance, and encourage increased community partnerships with businesses and organizations dedicated to building a more inclusive experience. Thank you, Ms. Eismoheiser, for that wonderful recognition. At this time, I would like to call on Ms. Darna Koufax for the VSBA Business Honor Roll Resolution. Thank you, Madam Chair. Honored to present this. Whereas public schools and local businesses are an integral part of this community, and whereas many local businesses play a crucial role in supporting our schools, and whereas the e economic health of our community, state, and nation depends on a strong public school system, and whereas collaboration between local public schools and local businesses strengthens schools and the business community alike by providing a well-trained and highly educated workforce, and whereas an excellent public school system is vital to the quality of life in this community and fundamental to preserving a strong democratic society now and in the future, Therefore, be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board names Capital Area Food Bank, Cox Communications, Cox Business, and Synetic Theater to the 2021 Virginia School Boards Association Business Honor Roll in appreciation for their ongoing support of Fairfax County Public Schools. I so move. Thank you. Is there a second? Ms. Corbett Sanders, thank you. Would you like to speak to, would any school board members like to speak to this resolution? Ms. Corbett Sanders? I think uh, Ms. Darinak Koufax, as the maker of the motion, would like to go first and I'll follow her if that's okay with you, Dr. Anderson. Of course. Absol absolutely, just very briefly. Um, I, I thank um, these organizations for their wonderful support as noted in the resolution. Um, businesses partnering with public schools are most important. I look forward to a time where we honor them later this summer. Ms. Corbett Sanders, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. I wanted to give a special shout out to these businesses this year in particular, because in the year of COVID, having strategic and strong relationships with our business community is critical. And I look at, the, at two of these businesses that have been lifelines for our most vulnerable in our community over the past year, being both the Capital Area Food Bank as well as Cox Communications. And then we get to Synetic um, Theater, which obviously is something that we all look forward to being able to once again return to. And their work with our youth is so important for their social emotional uh, well-being as well. So I am particularly pleased to see these three, meet, three businesses nominated this year. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board members wishing to speak to this resolution? Seeing none, I will now call for the vote. All in favor? Ms. McLaughlin, Mr. Frisch. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Mr. Frisch, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Sizemore Heiser, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Bakarski, Ms. Marin, Ms. Omeish, Ms. Darren Koufax, Ms. Tolan, and myself. That is 11 and is unanimous. Thank you. Item 2.09, VSBA Equity and Education Month. There were some wording and editing issues with the equity resolution approved by the school board meeting on March 4. As, as a result, the approved equity resolution did not reflect the language of the VSBA equity resolution that the board thought it was approving. So a motion to rescind the equity resolution, approved on March 4, will be in order. 
Does the member wish to make such a motion? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Marin. Is there a second? Thank you, Ms. Pekarski. Ms. Marin, would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, no, but I will be happy to read it uh, when it's time. Thank you, Ms. Pekarski. No. Any others who wish to speak? Ms. Omesh. I'd actually like to uh, move to amend this motion uh, rather than rescind our bold commitment on equity. I, want, I would like to amend this to read, to modify the record to post the previous resolution as an FCPS equity resolution. Would you please repeat your amendment? To modify the record to post the previous resolution as an FCPS equity resolution rather than rescind our commitment to equity. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second for the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Ms. Omesh, would you like to speak to your, to your amendment? Yes, thank you. Uh, we I, I, I read on behalf of the board last meeting a bold stance on equity, uh, establishing a commitment that we look to ourselves first, and the importance of understanding the legacy of our past and how it informs our future. Uh, I think it was an important statement that um, you know, we made, and I would prefer uh, and understanding that there was an issue, uh, some folks felt uncomfortable, um, that, that it wasn't posted as a VSBA official uh, uh, resolution, that in lieu of that, since today we are presenting that, we, uh, we stand by those words uh, and saying that it's an FCPS resolution. Thank you. Mr. Frisch, would you like to speak to your second? No, I'm good, thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers to this? Ms. Marin. Ms. Omesh, I always uh, appreciate and admire your passion for equity, and I think that in um, that I, I agree with the, the words that you said. However, that motion uh, was very eloquent, but it was not something by the body of the board. So I do believe that this motion that I'm um, presenting today is what the board was informed that we were doing, and I would like to do more to if we want to offer another. Um, a full FCPS resolution or FCPS equity, but that statement that you provided was not representative of the body or the division. I think when we do the work for the anti-racist policy, that your words and vision can help guide that work. But for tonight, I think that, that my motion is, is the one to um, go forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Marin. Any other speakers? Ms. McLaughlin, I'm so sorry, was that your hand? I'm struggling a little bit with, that, with this. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Marin. Seeing that there are no other speakers to the... Doctor. Oh, I'm so sorry. Ms. Omesh, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I'd like to be very clear. Um, I, I do appreciate Ms. Marin's comments. You know, in, in drafting this resolution, as we all often do, uh, and is regular practice for our board, in drafting resolutions that we bring forward, as I was asked to do on equity, um, you know, there was an understanding um, that we as a, as a team uh, have an understanding about equity. I, I think, you know, frankly, I think it's fair for the public to know, and I suppose they will know now by our votes, um, who was comfortable with that language and who wasn't. I understand there was conversation about folks being uncomfortable uh, with the extent and the boldness uh, to which I went with that resolution. Um, I do believe it represents where our, you know, our, our families and especially our students are. I know this is very uncomfortable for me to say, uh, but I, I do think it's only fair that, that it be very clear why we're coming back now to revisit an equity resolution that we all should have been standing by and should have had no problem with whatsoever. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. Uh, seeing that there are no other speakers, I will quickly like to take a turn to speak to the amendment. I will not be supporting the amendment, Ms. Omesh, not because of the um, intent that was behind it, but procedurally it was not appropriate. And we need to be sure that all of our board members have the opportunity to be clear on what it is that they're going to be voting for. This is a commitment we've made to each other. And I do realize there were errors. There were errors, and this is not a blame to you or to anyone else, but there were errors, and now we need to be sure that we can right the ship. So thank you. At this time, I would like to call for the vote on the amendment, which is to modify the record to identify the previous um, resolution as in FCPS equity resolution. All of those in favor?
We have Ms. McLaughlin. Okay, I will repeat. The amendment which is being put forward by Ms. Omesh is to re, not to resend the previous um, equity resolution, but to, rec to record it as the FCPS um, equity resolution. So all those in favor, we have Mr. Frisch, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Omesh. All of those against, we have Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Marin, Ms. Tolan, Ms. Danak Koufax, and myself. Those abstaining, we have Ms. Um, Seismoheiser. The motion does not pass. We will go back and have our vote on rescinding of the initial resolution as presented in the motion that I read earlier. Are there any other speakers to that main motion? Now we will take the vote on that motion to rescind. All those in favor? Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Seismoheiser, Ms. Corbett Sanders, whew, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Marin, Ms. Tolan, Ms. Darnot Koufax, and myself. All of those against? Mr. Frisch, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Omesh. The motion passes to rescind. I now call on Ms. Seismoheiser for a resolution. I think Ms. Marin was going to ask you, Sheriff, instead. Oh, I apologize. Ms. Marin. Thank you. Yes, the, this is the Virginia School Board Association's Equity and Education Month resolution. Whereas Governor Ralph Northam declared November 30 to December 6, 2020, Ed Equity Virginia Week, and the Virginia Department of Education announced the inaugural, inaugural Equity Policy, Virginia's Roadmap to Equity, and the recipients of the Mary Peak Award for Excellence in Education Equity, which recognizes educators, policymakers, school leaders, and stakeholder organizations whose, leader, whose service and leadership is impacting equity outcomes for Virginia students. And whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed inequities in schools and the increasingly significant challenge and responsibility we have in addressing them, and whereas the majority of school-age students in the United States of America are children of color, and in Virginia, 50% of public school students qualify for subsidized meals, and whereas we recognize that factors including but not limited to disability, race, ethnicity, language preference, and socioeconomic status have a demonstrated history of impacting the educational opportunities provided to a student, and whereas the promise of public education is for every child to be successful in school and life, and whereas it is important for Virginia families, students, teachers, and school administrators to be aware of the diverse needs of learners and to encourage discussion of the challenges of the school community, and whereas the Virginia School Boards Association has established a task force on students and schools in challenging environments to make recommendations and to stay at the forefront of discussions and actions to make student opportunities more equitable in Virginia schools, and whereas we recognize that inequities in resources, including educational settings and buildings, supplies, and technology technology, impedes student learning, and it is our responsibility to directly address these inequities. Now, therefore, the Fairfax County School Board recognizes March 2021 as Virginia School Boards Association Equity in Education Month in Fairfax County, and we call this observance to the attention of all of our residents. I so move. Is there a second? Thank you, Ms. Seismoheiser. Ms. Marin, would you like to speak to your resolution? No, thank you. Ms. Seismoheiser. I'll simply say that I'm glad that we're continuing to keep equity at the center of all we do, as Dr. Brabrand often, often says. Thank you. Thank you. Other board members wishing to speak? Seeing Ms. Corbett Sanders. I'll be very brief. Um, I think this is such an important resolution because it's a resolution by all of the um, school boards in the state of Virginia. And as somebody who was raised in the state of Virginia, uh, that was not always the case where school boards across the state embraced equity. And so having a um, common uh, voice on the importance of equity for each of our students, not only here in Fairfax County, but across the state is so critical. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Ms. McLaughlin. I, I, yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, while I deeply appreciate um, our colleague, Abraham advocacy earlier, 
I would like to reinforce what uh, my colleague, Ms. Rajna Sizemore-Heiser said. I am extremely proud to be part of a board that puts equity in the center. And I think we've demonstrated that in our work this year, and we've absolutely demonstrated it in prior boards. We have work to do, no doubt about it. Um, and we are learning so much along the way. But I wanna make sure the public knows that uh, this is a board that absolutely partnered with the Board of Supervisors when we created One Fairfax, when we created the resolution, when we created our policies. And we have shown a commitment when we created the Chief Equity Officer position. This is a lot of work that we've demonstrated our commitment. We are looking to make more data-driven decisions, more investments in staff in our region offices toward equity. So while I appreciate Ms. Omish's passion, it, all of us on this board are passionate, um, but I, I, I want to make sure that no one is left thinking that this board isn't committed to equity. And so I thank you, Ms. Marin, for forwarding and motioning for the, the VSBA equity resolution so that we can be in solidarity with school districts all around the Commonwealth. It's a good day for that. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Ms. Omesh? Yeah, thank you. I do appreciate that we can be in sync with various school boards from across the state uh, in recognizing the VSBA equity resolution. I think as a county, we ought to lead as FCPS in being even bolder on equity than the rest of the state, given we are one of the, you know, one of the, the capital of the Confederacy, one of the uh, a, sta a state with quite the legacy. And being Northern Virginia, we have uh, a unique bent to that, given the extent of the diversity we have. Uh, I appreciate where Ms. McLaughlin highlighted some of the efforts we have been working on, uh, but this is I'm, I, my attempt to be a witness to the truth in this circumstance uh, where we cannot have this continue to be platitudes. We're talking about equity. We weren't even comfortable enough with a resolution that was st strong in its language on equity. And now we have to vote on this resolution Despite, by the way, my amendment would have fixed the clerical issue that folks had, okay, the, the error about the technicality. We could have resolved that. But now we find ourselves voting for this because folks are more comfortable with that. I, I, just, I, I just have to be honest and clear about that, and I think I present it as a moment of reflection for us because, uh, you know, I, I can speak to why I support equity, I can speak to these things and why they matter, but what, everything about what I said earlier about internalizing these things, really questioning ourselves and asking ourselves where we are as a division and being bold to make sure it happens, to, to push against the tidal wave of inequity and the legacy that's been passed that is against that, that requires us being courageous and bold. And I'm sorry to see us here, but I am hopeful for the future and I hope my, you know, I can work together with my colleagues in really seeing that and understanding that because I know the students have led in that direction and I'm, and I'm proud to follow what I know the future is going to bring. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. Ms. Marin? Ms. Omesh, as I said before, I admire your enthusiasm. I, I too have a great enthusiasm and commitment to equity as do our members here. This is, as Dr. Anderson said, a clerical issue. This was not, what you presented was a very eloquent statement of your thinking. It was not a statement of this board as a body. And that is not the way that this board is supposed to operate. So having not seen that motion prior to that evening, I did not have time to review it. We are part of the Virginia School Board Association. It is one way, one of many, many ways that we are committed to equity. So I look forward to working on the many other ways that we're doing this, and I think that tonight's approach and action is appropriate. Thank you. Seeing, seeing that there are no other speakers to this motion, I will now call for the vote. All in favor of the VSBA resolution, please raise your hands. Ms. McLaughlin, Mr. Frisch, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Sizemore-Heiser, Ms. Corbett-Sanders, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Marin, Ms. Omesh, Ms. Darnay Koufax, Ms. Tolan, and myself. That is unanimous with 11. The next order of business is citizen participation. Speakers are requested to limit their remarks to not more than three minutes. The school board will not hear statements involving issues that have been scheduled for public hearings, such as capital improvement program, budget, and boundaries. Speakers should only address new business action items or resolutions as listed on the meeting agenda. 
Complaints regarding individual students or school-based employees should be directed to the appropriate school principal or other school official. Speakers should refrain from using personally identifiable information in connection with an individual student and are expected to deliver their comments with the decorum and respect appropriate to the conduct of the public's business. In-person speakers should, uh, should wear a mask, stand behind the black line on the floor, and speak into the microphone. Thank you for your cooperation, and thanks to those who have come to speak to us today. I'll now call to our clerk to call the first speakers. Our first speaker is Safa Chowen. Hello, my name is Safa Chohan, and I'm a junior attending Centerville High School. Thank you for letting myself and other citizens speak today. First, before I begin, I'd like everyone here and watching at home to take a moment and reflect. Think about the kids between um, deciding between missing their education or expressing their religious identity by observing their religious holidays. Imagine feeling like you are unimportant because the people that are supposed to be leaders in your county seem to say so that you're not through their decisions. Imagine seeing your peers have the opportunity to spend time and enjoy their Christmases and Easter's. While well, on your holidays, you have to make up work that you shouldn't have to in the first place. Seems unfair, right? There shouldn't be a dichotomy between cho choosing. Even more, it seems common sense to allow kids to follow their religion. Like I says before, if you guys want to see equity in AAPI students, it starts just simply including them in the calendar. Why should students sacrifice their mental health? And why should students and families choose between missing important um, religious obligations. As a Muslim and being friends with peers from different religious beliefs, I am disappointed. We are all disappointed. We are disappointed that only performative actions are being taken, like only highlighting dates to take off their, um, to take off rather than actually taking the action to do so. We are disappointed that the inclusivity of all students are not being taken to account for. This is why option D for the calendar might be favorable, but it needs to be more effective in making tangible change that we need to see. It's not a clear solution, but we could get there. It doesn't take into account for Lunar New Year, Yom Kippur, or all Eid holidays and much more holidays. FCPS, as we all know, is increasingly being diversified. It's time that our board recognizes that. Please take time to figure out and look at the data that is presented to you, and you will see that there needs to be a day off for holidays. On top of all of this, and even more forward, students that miss, a days, miss out on tests, presentations, that are all viable to a successful student. These factors are huge negative detriments of mental health. Grades could fall, catching up is mentally and physically exhausting, and can we talk about how traumatic it is to go through to observe a holiday that holds important to a student? This trauma is fostered by diverse experiences that our leaders of our county are afraid or can't handle, so please do better. You say that you care about student successes and well-being, well, let's act on it together. Take extra snow days, combine teacher work days. There's so much opportunity to make our schools a better place for everyone, but it's missed. We have records of past meetings and statements that all of you promising that you'll be the leaders for all re students' religions and to make our calendars accommodating. Also, moreover, please take action on our mental health. Treat it like the world pandemic we are in, which it is. Kids are dying, self-harming themselves, and not being able to do work with no proper outlet, so we, we, we need to train teachers and counselors properly, have comprehensive mental health screenings that account for intersectionality. How many times do we have to see our own peers inflict themselves a self-harm? Or when I got a text saying that my closest friend was gonna take her own life because she couldn't find her proper support. You as a board have made promises, you are the decision makers, and you can literally save lives and ensure a more inclusive county. You have the opportunity to do so that tonight. So do it. You have the power. Us as students have the voice. Let's work together. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chaz Dial. Hello, my name is Chaz Dial, and I'm in Ms. Hagee's fourth grade class at Oakview. I'm here to t today to talk about the calendar. I have one... I want whatever calendar you choose to save five days of in-person each week. In fact, it should start next week. It was super awesome seeing my teacher in person this week. Being in person has improved my ability to focus a lot. During virtual school, I know some kids in my class won't speak unless they're in small groups. 
and I don't like to participate in class because of the screen. Yesterday was the best day of school ever this year because my teacher said I did a great job and I was super engaged in class. Today, class was really hard again because it was virtual. I keep getting tempted to go over to YouTube or browse Amazon. I would guess that a ton of Fair Fairfax County kids are probably watching YouTube or other things that they shouldn't be doing on a school computer during virtual class or, re quote, recess. Virtual school has made me behind in what I'm supposed to learn this year. I'm tired of my mom giving me extra work to catch up on. By the way, I'm not blaming my teacher. She's doing a great job, but because it's virtual, she can't cover everything I need. I love my mom, but she's not a professional teacher. I want to be with Miss Aggie, my teacher, five days of in person each, each week. I also want to discuss the recess problem. Why are we not allowed to play on the equipment? We can't play any basketball. We can't play any tag. Why? I play on the playground with my friends outside of school hours. Why can't we play during recess? Why can't we play a basketball during recess? Are you worried that we're going to lick the basketball? We know how to wash our hands. I mean, really, we've been uber washing and sanitizing our hands for it now for a year. I think we know how to take protective measures. The playground equipment has all kinds of germs. I get that, but it's, but again, it's not like we're going to lick the jungle gym. We can wash our hands. My former doctor, Dr. Martin, talked to you guys two weeks ago and said we can be three feet away. The CDC says it's okay. Why are you obsessed with six feet distancing? Why have you done this to all the kids and, and to me? Why? This has been the hardest year in my life and likely for all the other kids. And some other kids have even had it harder. Please listen to all the doctors and scientists that have shown all over the world that we can be in person five days a week without increased risk. Open the schools. Our future depends on it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Chair, we need just one minute to fix the timer. Okay, our next speaker is Hira Bakaja. Good evening, all. My name is Khaira Bakaja, and I'm a senior at Edison High School. Now, more than ever, it's imperative that we collectively prioritize the importance of mental health by implementing proactive measures rather than being reactive. For the past few weeks, 40 students across 15 high schools in our county have come together to express deep concerns that this mindset must be altered immediately in hopes of ensuring overall positive well-being. Words can express how disheartening it is for me to listen to the challenges our students are going through. Currently, FCPS's approach is streamlining the mental health issues arising reactively through counselor intervention, performative and unengaging SEL curriculum teaching, or grief sessions. Today is the day you also vote on the school year calendar 21 to 22. On March 4th, 2021, you all passed a follow-on motion to direct the superintendent to identify religious and culturally significant days that could result in significant absenteeism and create regulations that do not currently exist for the manner in which FCPS will designate impermissible activities on said days to prevent negative impact upon the academic, social, or emotional well-being of those students who engage in such observances. The Religious Observances Task Force, staff, students, and community are beseeching you to vote on Calendar Virgin D. Section 5, Part C of the One Fairfax policy states that equity tools such as equity impact and analysis, disparity studies, and so on will be used to ensure that equity is considered intentionally in decision making. The data has been presented multiple times. Thousands of students in our school are absent on holidays, such as Eid, the High Holy Jewish Days, and many more. Personally, I know that myself and many more will feel deflated after so much advocacy for calendar version D to not be voted on. Therefore, making this pertinent and in relation 
to overall mental health well-being. Remember that diversity is inviting people to the party and inclusion is asking them to dance. One can only do so much, so I am asking you, the elected school board members, to vote on calendar version D. Together, we will emulate one Fairfax. Thank you. Our next speaker is Thomas Goudreau. Good evening. I want to thank the school board for not approving or making go away the proposed one and a half million dollar transfer to Northern Virginia Community College tonight. While I share the goal of increasing access to higher education for underrepresented students, the most impactful investment the school board can make toward that goal is to return students to the classroom five days a week. Last month, I recommended that the school board prioritize one, return Fairfax County students five days a week to in-person learning as soon as possible. Two, return FCPS performance to pre-COVID levels, both academically and culturally. And three, repair the damaged relationships among FCPS, students, families, and the community. FCPS principals planning for five days a week in-person learning have unfunded needs. Some can pretend we are not behind, but FCPS choosing not to offer full-time in-person instruction has made our students less competitive. Overcoming all FCPS obstacles that prevent students from returning five days a week to in-person learning is going to take more resources than currently budgeted. Teachers teaching in the classroom deserve the full support of FCPS. FCPS cannot continue to spend monies on pet projects, programs, and activities that do not support in-person learning. FCPS, sadly, has lost the trust of too many families. Thousands have left, school ratings are falling, and property taxes are increasing. Do the right thing and invest our money on fully funding five days a week in-person instruction. What will it take for FCPS to return to all in-person students five days a week this May? What better way to trial run the full reopening this August than bringing us all back? Fully reopen the schools this school year and understand the costs we face in September and in August. In the meantime, any expense not directly supporting five days a week in-person education should be deferred or canceled. Even with a planned Fairfax County tax increase later this year, there won't be enough money to fully support classroom teachers. I have teachers now with GoFundMe accounts, requests through the PTA, requests to students for materials. Do you really expect PTAs to fill the gap while you spend money on things that are nice to have? School, in person, five days a week, return educational quality to our previous nationwide leadership levels. Do both this school year, and you'll be off to a good start addressing the tensions between FCPS, many students, and the families. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Suzanne Powers. Hi, good evening. My name is Suzanne Powers, and I am a pediatrician at Reston Town Center Pediatrics. I came to speak about the calendar and five-day-a-week in-person learning for the, our children. I came in person tonight because I believe it's the most effective way to get my point across. Don't get me wrong, technology has been a godsend for us. We have tried, um, in, as we have tried to mitigate the risks of COVID-19, um, however, it has limitations. I applaud the board's recent decision to go back to five day a week in-person learning in the fall. However, I am worried about the children across the county who are currently experiencing unprecedented increases in depression, anxiety, ADHD, addiction, suicide attempts, obesity, eating disorders, child abuse, parental stress, food and housing insecurity, and behavioral problems. These children need our help now. I believe one of the best ways to help them is to get them back to full-time in-person learning as soon as possible. Schools not only play a role in the education of our children, they are essential for our child's socialization. 
They give a child a safe place to learn, and they may supply the only food the child eats that day. Since the pandemic started, I have been confronted with depressed and anxious children as young as seven and eight years of age. I have become intimately familiar with a questionnaire called the ASQ. That's the Ask Suicide Screening Questions. I now routinely see one to three patients a day with a mental health concern. And I have personally had three of my own patients admitted to the hospital for suicidal ideation or attempts in 2021. This is unprecedented in my 20-year pediatric career. And while I'm working with the patients and their families to get these children the help they need, the counseling and the appropriate medications, I can't do it alone. I'm not gonna bore you with the numbers, but I wish to reiterate several points that make school reopening safe. Masking is an effective, extremely effective means of decreasing transmission. As a frontline medical provider, my office has remained open throughout the pandemic, and we have had zero cases of COVID transmission, despite having many patients test positive for the virus and being in close contact with them, basically essentially zero, zero feet apart when I examine them. With strict adherence to masking, the three feet of social distancing in schools is safe and based on clinical evidence and should be um, recommended if six feet is not achievable during, due to space um, restrictions. Schools have not been found to be super spreader locations. In fact, studies have shown most schools that have returned to in-person learning have had significant lower rates of transmission than their surrounding communities. Given the overwhelming evidence that children are being harmed by schools not being open full time and the overwhelming evidence that school reopening is safe for teachers, staff, and students, I urge that preparations are made for the immediate reopening of full time in person learning in Fairfax County. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Rodriguez Golden. Good evening, I'm a mom of a high school senior. I wanna highlight some observations I and other parents have had over the past year, especially relating to high school seniors. I speak for many struggling seniors whose opportunities, choices, and dreams were canceled last summer when the in-person choice was delayed. This trend continued, plans and meetings to reopen, plans and meetings to cancel, postpone, and reevaluate. This happened multiple times. While six U.S. systems larger than FCPS were offering an in-person option in the fall, FCPS repeatedly denied it. When the January return to school plan was canceled abruptly, my senior and so many of his peers disconnected for good. The damage to seniors is profound. In my small circle, I know of kids who have given up, going from applying to college to taking an unplanned gap year. Kids who have been hospitalized for self-harming behaviors Kids who've become medicated due to the lack of communication and connectivity to one another in school. Your decisions altered the once in a lifetime experience as seniors, the head of the school, and all the status and special attention afforded to them deleted. In February, with 60% of their senior year over, more than 100 days into the academic year, high schools were finally told they needed to acknowledge seniors and hold events. By the return to school date of March 2nd, most seniors were done. Here are some senior quotes for the yearbook. Just give me my diploma so I can go. Too little, too late. They don't care. My teacher says school will be like prison. Everything we ask them to let us do, they just say no. It has been disappointing to watch the disparity between school engagement events. During this pandemic with virtual school, a school's public facing website could have been used as an incredible tool to keep kids and families engaged and informed? Was there guidance and oversight holding the schools to a standard for what they were and were not doing for seniors and the student body in general? For example, one current high school site features seniors and events from the year 2019 to 2020. What does that tell you about the level of oversight and expectations to maintain equity in communication and ensure steps are being taken to keep kids connected? Is there guidance and support to ensure equity in events like live town halls, coffees, and websites that are regularly updated with the specific purpose to engage families? I implore you to support schools with standards of communication and engagement these final months. Think outside the box and support final celebrations like graduation, pep rallies, a prom, a senior parade, 
all outdoors. You have a few months, make them count. Thank you. Our next speaker is Vanessa Hall. Hi, um, I've heard friends' concerns about the school calendar. You listened, which is why I think you created Calendar D. However, I'm concerned that at a school we implement it diversely or respectfully. I've heard guidance already exists that tests are not to be scheduled on religious holidays, yet tests have been scheduled on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the holiest day of the Jewish year. If the board is committed to equity and inclusivity, they must listen to the repeated requests of non-Christian students and their families. It's critical that respect for religious holidays is universally implemented across all schools and by all teachers. These holidays are on a calendar and in people's hearts. Please respect them. Speaking of calendars, thank you for announcing the intention to in-person schooling five days a week in the fall. Of course, this is contingent on continued COVID mitigation and space availability, but from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. Some are pushing for five days of school before the end of the school year, but think about school spring break. Don't forget the lessons learned from Thanksgiving and winter break around the nation as COVID cases rose precipitously after those breaks, thereby contributing to the second COVID wave that has only recently abated. I bring up this concern because there are estimates that 10 to 33% of COVID patients become long haul COVID patients, meaning that mild to severe COVID systems, symptoms can persist for months and has supposedly recovered. This is happening to hospitalized COVID patients and those who suffered only mild symptoms. It's happening to adults and children. Despite excellent health before contracting COVID, many have suffered permanent damage to heart and lungs and long-term neurological issues. Recently, the London Times reported that as many as 80,000 children in England may be suffering from long-term COVID and that their lives have been stalled by the virus. In the US, the NIH is researching the wide range of impacts on children, including those like 15-year-old Delaney, a competitive dancer who contracted COVID in June and now has COPD, a disease mainly reserved for smokers. It's also important to note that some communities have disproportionately been affected by COVID. Of the children who've died from COVID, 75% were Black, Hispanic, American Indian, or Alaskan Native. A Yale study found that three of four children hospitalized with severe COVID were Black or Hispanic, and at least 69% of the MISC cases have occurred in children who are Black or Hispanic. There's so much we still don't know about COVID, so please don't give in to forces who push for five days right now. Instead, let's all work together on making safe schools, not just open schools, so that we can have full in-person learning in the fall. And thank you all for your hard work. Thank you. Our next speaker is Olivia Tuggle. Thank you to the school board for this opportunity to speak. I'm a parent of two students in FCPS. I've been thinking about the welfare of our children, their mental health, food insecurity, abusive families, affordable childcare, and the unstable job market for their parents. These are all valid concerns. On the other hand, it's not the school's responsibility to provide solutions for these complex social issues. We as, as a, a community, community need to reevaluate the expectation for, for, for public, public schools. schools. The rising case of depression and suicide in adolescents are tragic. Any parent with an emotionally at-risk child should seek licensed mental health treatment. Fairfax County Public Health Department has community-based service board. It is a community-based program that provides behavioral health treatment for children, youth, and families regardless of their income. The reliance of some families on FCPS for food delivery is unfortunate. Luckily, we have SNAP, WIC, and Human Services Resources Guide. HSRG on fairfaxcounty.gov is a sociable database of resources available to low-income residents. I too worry about the children spending more time in abusive homes. School is a short-term respite for abuse that happened before schools close and they will not stop after they open. It's not the schools that can reap it's not only the schools that can report or prevent abuse. Extended family members, friends, neighbors, and clergy can also identify and report abuse. The rising cost of childcare is unaffordable to some families. It's no wonder why many parents have become reliant on free childcare that public schools provide. Again, this is not the purpose of public school. 
it was an underappreciated perk. The unstable job market has made working from home or taking medical leave even harder. Again, it's not FCP's responsibility to get parents back into the workforce. Unemployment is a complicated issue that should be addressed by the entire community. We are all suffering from this pandemic. We all want children to go back to school, but rushing into five days a week could potentially set us back in the fight against COVID. Thank you so much to FCPS teachers, administrative staff, and support staff for all that you do. These tough times have shined a light on the many services that we are now realizing we have taken for granted. I know you're doing your best and look forward to the day we can all go back to school safely. Please focus on fighting COVID, not the schools. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kimberly Adams. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Kimberly Adams and I'm speaking as the president of the Fairfax Education Association. Tonight we are concerned that your new calendar D option is simply offering guidance to the system about religious holidays that are observed but may not be honored, especially for those employees who may have this time denied under regulations if it may negatively impact their program due to an increase in absence of staff on a particular day. Calendar A and B were developed with the many inputs of stakeholders in the calendar committee who annually participate in the deep engagement process of the calendar for the school year ahead. We took the collaboration with school systems surrounding us into account. We worked with religious leaders outside the system to ensure that those holidays would be honored. At this point, the calendar committee should be recommending action on the 2022-2023 calendar. This annual process is supposed to provide notice for the community on how to plan in advance for student activities as well as over breaks and holidays. This 2021-2022 calendar was meant to be acted upon months ago. And yes, we're in a global pandemic, but all of the observances from calendar D should be recognized in the same way on calendar A and B that were presented by your committee, voted on and moved on to the next school year. We must continue this work for our community. Tonight, we also highlight the practice of concurrent instruction that continues to raise concerns for educators and families. This model requires that instructional focus be significantly divided between two jobs, concurrent and in-person teaching, in-person and virtual learning and teaching. We expect that in the next school year that we will assess this differently to ensure that those online and those in person have a teacher dedicated for them. Instructional staff should never be made to have a choice forced on them between the staff online, the students online, and those students in front of them in person. This is overwhelming teachers already, and we are only a few weeks in. We believe that the teachers should have, should, the students should have the teachers full attention. I'll leave you with some quotes of how this has already proven to be problematic. I'm a kindergarten teacher. Teaching both groups of children at the same time is wrong. These children have been dealing with their parents' divided attention since March, and they deserve our full attention when they're in our schools. Teaching this way compromises our safety, and I had intended to do a good deal of outdoor learning to focus my lessons and keep ventilation in mind. That's not possible with this current plan. This is the most exhausting thing I have ever done. This is not sustainable. I wish every principal and school board member was asked to do this for just one week. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker is Joanne Sears. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you so much for your time. Good evening. My name is Joanne Sears, and I'm, a, and I'm speaking on behalf of over 2,300 parents who are members of the nonpartisan Open SDPS Coalition and people who trust science and data. Thank you to the board for this opportunity. I'm here to discuss the calendar for next year and the importance of in-person education uh, for all of our children. This past week, the FCPS school board acknowledged an on paper goal of what so many of other school systems across the United States have already been doing since last fall, allowing, this, allowing the choice for the return to in-person learning. We have sat through school board meeting after school board meeting where everything but a thoughtful back to school plan is put forward. We have watched school board members performative dramas on social media about staying safe while going on vacation, 
demanding restaurants closed while keeping their store open for business and doing everything but putting our children first. And thankfully, tomorrow, thanks to advocates like parents and families from Open FCPS, the CDC will announce, because of sound science, a reduction of six feet to three feet for in-person learning parameters. In the past week, school board members and town halls and newsletters have assured parents FCPS has been looking at how to give in-person students access to four days a week starting after spring break. But the truth is, there is not a clear path for this. The truth is, FCPS has not conducted any research about other school districts that are successfully running. We did that for you, for free, and posted it on Twitter. Parents will not soon forget. Faced with the largest education crisis in decades, this country, this school system repeatedly said it cannot serve the best interests of its students. We also will not forget being harassed, bullied, and threatened by this school board and your surrogates. And we will not be silenced because we love our children with every ounce of our heart and soul. But here's the truth. We are behind. Our children have paid a terrible price because the elected officials in their lives gave up and gave in to organized labor. The only thing FCPS is not behind on is the race to the bottom. And changing the grading scale is but a mere symptom of a greater problem. By changing grades, FCPS is going to be able to graduate a larger number of students. This harms all kids, not just special ed kids. They should graduate having had their needs met. From the initial disastrous rollout of virtual education in the spring of 2020, to the repeated false starts and excuses about providing students a choice, even as science and school districts all over the US and the world have been open for our learning. What can and should you do? Open the schools as soon as possible for full-time in-person learning. Our children deserve better and I parents that's won't time. forget. Dial it up, yes, open up CPS. Thank you. We have five video speakers or video testimony. Sarah Doan, Lisa Turkeltab, Aaron Fulp Eichelstadt, Srilika Payel, and Diane Cooper Gould. Hello, my name is Sarah Doan, and I'm a Jewish junior at George C. Marshall High School in Fairfax County Public Schools. My experience with the conflict of Jewish holidays in school has been pretty difficult. For example, my sophomore year, I had my first IB chemistry test scheduled on Yom Kippur, one of the holiest days for, on the Jewish calendar. I emailed my teacher and I told her that I was not able to come to school that day for a religious reason, and she ended up changing the test and delaying it. However, she scheduled a review day on the day of Yom Kippur instead. I had to make the tough decision of whether or not I was able to go to services or if I had to go to school and take the test. With my family, I ended up making the decision to go to school. I felt that I would be at a, I would be at a disadvantage if I didn't go to school that day for the review. IB chemistry is one of the harder, one of my harder classes, and I was unable to take the test if I hadn't done the review. I had to make this tough decision because Fairfax County Public Schools did not take off one of the holiest days of the Jewish calendar off of school. Hi, I'm Marcy Schwab, Sarah Doan's mom. As you just heard Sarah say, she spent Yom Kippur of her sophomore year in school while we, her entire family, spent time at synagogue. That was a really tough day for all of us, knowing that we were praying on the holiest day of the year while she was in school. Even tougher was leading up to that day when she had to go to each and every one of her teachers and talk to them about what she'd be missing if she weren't to attend school. It's really tough psychologically for a student to have to go and talk to every teacher, tell them that she's Jewish, and then explain that she'd be missing the day and try and make up the work. Uh, she's never missed a holiday until then, and our family really missed her. We missed her terribly that day. Um, imagine what it felt like for her to be in school on the holiest day on the religious calendar. Um, it, despite the fact that Fairfax County teachers are told that those days are not meant to be uh, days of tests or new material, inevitably every year teachers present new material or scheduled tests or field days on those days. 
We'd really like Fairfax County to represent the diversity of our community and acknowledge that uh, days on the calendar that are special to certain people should be acknowledged. All teachers, students, and parents feel the stress and frustration of making the decision of whether or not to go to school on their holidays. We urge you to adopt a schedule that takes into account the diversity of our community. Hi, I would like to give you a little update about what um, some of the advocacy is doing, um, the open school advocacy is doing. Um, so our mission right now is to educate the public about what is happening with our school board, what you guys are talking about, inform the general public about what you guys are talking about and not talking about at your meetings. So on weekends, we have a group of people that goes out all over Fairfax County, and our job is to talk to any registered voter and make sure they are aware of the situation. And so we'll approach a voter and say, hey, can, can, you, can you speak with us for a minute? We'd like to update you on what the school board is doing about the closed school situation in Fairfax County. And most of the time, actually, people will talk to us. Yeah, what is the school doing? School board doing? Well, um, nothing. Um, in the month of February, in the month of March, they spent no school board time discussing how to get the kids in school for four or five days of in-person education, zero. And they say, so what are they doing? And that's easy. Um, the school board spends a lot of time talking about solar energy and um, the calendar. And you can go look at their YouTube videos and see how many hours they spend talking about the calendar and solar energy. And if you just listen to 10 seconds every 10 minutes on all these school board meetings that are five hours, you will find no discussion about return to five days of in-person education. And they say, well, how are private schools doing it? And we respond, private schools have been using three feet that's how Miami does it. That's how Houston does it. That's how every open school um, district does it. They use three feet of social distancing to enable, to enable the school to be open for five days, um, which is the whole point of a public education system is to have in-person learning for five days of education. And they, 65 and older crowd, you know, the voters, those are the voters that will show up in 2023 to the reelection. Um, you know what they say? 99% of the time, recall them all. Recall them all. And we will make sure that citizens know what is going on here, how your mission as a school board is to keep schools closed for four or five days indefinitely, how you have no plan as of Sunday night, March 14th, to reopen schools for four or five days of in-person education this school year, we will make sure that every voter knows and we will make sure they do not forget in 2021, 2022, and 2023. Recall them all. Let me begin by thanking you FCPS school board members and staff and other interested parties for this opportunity to speak. My name is Reverend Aaron Fulpikestad, and for the past 16 years, I've been the senior pastor of Emanuel Presbyterian Church in McLean. Over that time period, our congregation has engaged in shared service to the larger community with interfaith partners like Temple Road of Shalom and the McLean Islamic Center. And we are committed to standing in solidarity with them and others in the interfaith community, specifically in supporting the recommendation of the Religious Observance Task Force and the FCPS Calendar Committee add school holidays for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Eid, and Diwali. Let me tell you why. Martin Luther King Jr. in his treatment of the parable of the Good Samaritan said, the first question which the priest and the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the Good Samaritan reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? That's the sort of ethical stance that moves beyond self-interest and is higher than any one religious tradition or religion period for that matter. I love what the author George Saunders wrote in one of his short stories. In all things, we are the victims of the misconception from afar. 
the universal human laws, need, love for the beloved, fear, hunger, periodic exaltation, kindness that rises up naturally in the absence of fear, hunger, pain, are constant, predictable. What a powerful thing to know that one's own desires are mappable onto strangers. I believe that the misconception from afar is that we are fundamentally more different than we are alike. The deeper truth is that we all share the same basic needs and desires. One of those desires, especially in a school system like ours, which prides itself on being so culturally diverse, is to have our holiest days of religious observance respected is why the task force and committee made the recommendations they did. Both of my adult daughters came through Fairfax County Public Schools. Were I still a parent of an FCPS student, I would not want my child to have to take a test on Christmas or Good Friday or Easter Sunday. So I can imagine what it would feel like to be pressured to do so on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Eid or Diwali. With that in mind, I encourage you as a board join with so many other county school systems in this greater area and add those holidays to the school calendar. Hello, I'm Shrili Kapali, representing Hindu, Jain, and Sikh faith communities and Religious Observance Task Force, which comprises of Jewish, Muslim, and other minority faith communities. I would like to bring it to your attention that the existing academic calendar gives no hint of the demographic changes in Northern Virginia that have yielded a remarkably racially, ethnically, and religiously diverse student body. For years, members of minority faiths within FCPS have felt marginalized and disadvantaged because of their religious identity and observance. Students face review days or classroom tests on Diwali, assessment tests scheduled during Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and assignments due on or the day after Eid. Teachers and staff are forced to take personal days to observe or worse, feel unable to take those days at all. The pressure on students and employees to forego sacred observances is intense. The result is logistic, academic, and emotional strain on students, families, and educators. As a faith leader devoted to uniting people in common purpose, I am deeply concerned. My faith teaches me to honor the inherent worth and dignity of each person and to embrace justice. Granting four additional school closure days would have no practical impact on long-term academic recovery. It would, however, be a game changer for FCPS students, employees, and their families who have owned for this change for so long. The school board can fulfill its responsibilities to all of FCPS children without choosing between supporting religious equity and supporting academic equity. A viable solution to meet the needs of all affected communities was found in Arlington, Loudoun, and Prince William counties, and one can be found in Fairfax County as well. There is a saying that goes, where there's a will, there is a way. School board members face a choice. They must, you must, choose between inclusion and marginalization, between unity and division, and between progress and regression. I encourage the members of a school board to make the right choice. I strongly believe that school board should be focused on fostering a school system that reflects the best of American values, equal treatment, mutual respect, appreciation of the diversity that strengthen the fabric of our society and unity. Therefore, I sincerely request the board to pursue the goals of religious accommodation by voting for the adoption of a calendar for the upcoming school years. That would include closure on this coinciding with Diwali, Eid, Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur. Thank you for your time, and I appreciate your engagement. Good evening. I'm Diane Cooper-Gould, speaking as Advocacy Chair of Fairfax County SEPTA. I'm also the proud parent of an autistic son. Tonight, you recognized April as Autism Awareness Month. While we acknowledge the world still has a long way to go to recognizing and understanding what it means to be autistic, our community asks that FCPS begin to shift the focus to autism acceptance, not just awareness. Awareness is a good first step, but it does not go nearly far enough into understanding and embracing the experience of autistic persons. Thank you to Autistic Self-Advocate and FCPS graduate Jenny Bristol for her input into tonight's testimony. 
For too long, autism has been viewed via a medical model lens through which the autistic experience is seen as a problem to be solved rather than a natural neurodifference that presents challenges and gifts. Existing as an autistic individual in our society is to have your life experience pathologized, not understood nor accepted. This is a form of ableism that removes the autistic individual as an equal and valued member of society and leads to a culture in which we force autistic people to blend in or mask in order that they may be more palatable to the typically developing population. We spend huge amounts of money and time on therapies and curricula, some of which have been proven to do more harm than good. Nothing about us without us is a critical message from autistic self-advocates that FCPS and our community must embrace. As a school system, we must start bringing autistic individuals into the conversations about how they will be taught and supported. By including self-advocates in decision-making about harsh discipline practices like restraint and seclusion that are disproportionately used against them. By consulting autistic students and advocates when creating executive functioning and person development curricula that aim to help them by having difficult conversations about behaviorism and the history of ABA that has caused irreparable harm to some individuals on the spectrum, by actively ending the use of autism as a slur and showing zero tolerance for the bullying of our autistic students, and by reading the words of self-advocates and inviting them to the table to lead these discussions, we must celebrate that autism is not a problem to fix, but a difference to embrace. To make that change in our community, we must start by modeling that mindset shift in our schools. Autistic people are not a set of behaviors to be tamed. Autistic people are valuable members of our society who are as varied and complex as any other group of people. It's not enough to be aware. We must listen, include, accept, and celebrate differences. I encourage each of you to start by seeking out the voices of autistic self-advocates by visiting the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, or ASAN. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for everybody's um, edification. I understand that there were audio issues for the public watching at home. The first two videos were not heard um, by the public, so we will need to review those two videos again. Madam Clerk? Hello, my name is Sarah Doan and I'm a Jewish junior at George C. Marshall High School in Fairfax County Public Schools. My experience with the conflict of Jewish holidays in school has been pretty difficult. For example, my sophomore year, I had my first IB chemistry test scheduled on Yom Kippur, one of the holiest days for, on the Jewish calendar. I emailed my teacher and I told her that I was not able to come to school that day for a religious reason and she ended up changing the test and delaying it. However, she scheduled a review day on the day of Yom Kippur instead. I had to make the tough decision of whether or not I was able to go to services or if I had to go to school and take the test. With my family, I ended up making the decision to go to school. I felt that I would be at a I would be at a disadvantage if I didn't go to school that day for the review. IB chemistry is one of the harder, one of my harder classes and I was unable to take the test if I hadn't done the review. I had to make this tough decision because Fairfax County Public Schools did not take off one of the holiest days of the Jewish calendar off of school. Hi, I'm Marcy Schwab, Sarah Doan's mom. As you just heard Sarah say, she spent Yom Kippur of her sophomore year in school, while we, her entire family, spent time at synagogue. That was a really tough day for all of us, knowing that we were praying on the holiest day of the year while she was in school. Even tougher was leading up to that day, when she had to go to each and every one of her teachers and talk to them about what she'd be missing if she weren't to attend school. It's really tough psychologically for a student to have to go and talk to every teacher tell them that she's Jewish, and then explain that she'd be missing the day and try and make up the work. Uh, she's never missed a holiday until then, and our family really missed her. We missed her terribly that day. Um, imagine what it felt like for her to be in school on the holiest day on the religious calendar. Um, it, despite the fact that Fairfax County teachers are told that those days are not meant to be uh, 
phase of tests or new material, inevitably every year teachers present new material or schedule tests or field days on those days. We'd really like Fairfax County to represent the diversity of our community and acknowledge that uh, days on the calendar that are special to certain people should be acknowledged. All teachers, students, and parents feel the stress and frustration of making the decision of whether or not to go to school on their holidays. We urge you to adopt a schedule that takes into account the diversity of our community. Hi. I would like to give you a little update about what um, some of the advocacy is doing, um, the open school advocacy is doing. Um, so our mission right now is to educate the public about what is happening with our school board, what you guys are talking about, inform the general public about what you guys are talking about and not talking about at your meetings. So on weekends, we have a group of people that goes out all over Fairfax County, and our job is to talk to any registered voter and make sure they are aware of the situation. And so we'll approach a voter and say, hey, can, can, you, can you speak with us for a minute? We'd like to update you on what the school board is doing about the closed school situation in Fairfax County. And most of the time, actually, people will talk to us. Yeah, what is the school doing? School board doing? Well, um, nothing. Um, in the month of February, in the month of March, they spent no school board time discussing how to get the kids in school for four or five days of in-person education, zero. And they say, so what are they doing? And that's easy. Um, the school board spends a lot of time talking about solar energy and um, the calendar. And you can go look at their YouTube videos and see how many hours they spend talking about the calendar and solar energy. And if you just listen to 10 seconds every 10 minutes on all these school board meetings that are five hours, you will find no discussion about return to five days of in-person education. And they say, well, how are private schools doing it? And we respond, private schools have been using three feet that's how Miami does it. That's how Houston does it. That's how every open school um, district does it. They use three feet of social distancing to enable to enable the school to be open for five days, um, which is the whole point of a public education system is to have in-person learning for five days of education. And they, 65 and older crowd, you know, the voters, those are the voters that will show up in 2023 to the reelection. Um, you know what they say? 99% of the time, recall them all. Recall them all. And we will make sure that citizens know what is going on here, how your mission as a school board is to keep schools closed for four or five days indefinitely, how you have no plan as of Sunday night, March 14th, to reopen schools for four or five days of in-person education this school year, we will make sure that every voter knows and we will make sure they do not forget in 2021, 2022, and 2023. Recall them all. Thank you. <clears throat> At this time, we are at agenda item 3.02, student representative matters. I call on Mr. Anabudo. Thank you, um, Dr. Anderson. I'm feeling a bit under the weather, um, so my comments shouldn't be too long. But um, primarily today, I wanted to talk to the community um, around my thoughts as a student representative um, in regards to the grading policy updates that, that the leadership has just presented to the school, to this, um, school, school board and school community in the past days. Um, grading policy at FCPS and really America has long been a stagnant issue. In the context of a country that places a lot of state and federal expectations on the plate of our teachers, grading practices is arguably one of the last areas where teachers along with school-based departments are able to exercise the full extent of their professional expertise and judgment. This truth can make this a hard subject to broach, a broach, especially in regards to issues that often arise with complaints from students and families. 
Despite this, leading experts in the field of education are now pointing out the potential harm that our outdated forms of grading could be doing to students. While these truths are partially independent of the crisis learning situation COVID has put us all in, our leadership's recent action in terms of grading policy, however, is emblematic of how the pandemic has truly highlighted the inequities that exist and forced us to take action to reckon with some of these disparities. I'm thankful for the work our leadership has done in regard to this issue, and I urge the community to cheer on the additional supports that have been provided to students. I have unfortunately seen and heard some comments from community members accusing the system of just trying to make themselves look better or simply just trying to inflate grades. In the context of the trauma that students have endured, I truly think that these comments are not only harmful, but they're missing the forest for the trees. I believe we should all celebrate the community's effort to shift pandemic grading practices to recognize the context in which students are learning in, while simultaneously calling on the system to ensure that students in need across the system receive the additional academic opportunities they need to recover learning loss that has been lost this school year. These two things do not have to be independent of one another. News at the last work session that we plan to increase our summer learning program tenfold is extremely promising and I look forward to, up to continuing to update. Grades are not the only metric we need to use to identify gaps that have been created and exacerbated by this pandemic. And these supports don't erase those gaps or the work the system must do to try to close them. But they will certainly help to ensure that all the grades students receive this year are placed in the context of the trauma they have endured and the work that they have put in. Leadership, I'm thankful for your work. And I signal to you all that as with many things throughout these past few months, the work we have done on this front is just the beginning. And with that, I would just like to briefly add that, you know, today there's going to be, you guys are going to, you guys will take your votes on the calendar um, conversation. And I think that um, it's, just needs to be said that this is a chance to you guys to be, you, you all as board members to be bold um, on your move with equity. Um, and, and, and I'm talking about keeping that central to the things we do. I, I know there are nuances and complexities that add to this decision. And, you know, what we need to do as a system is also confounded by the hardships of the pandemic, but it doesn't change the promises we made to the community um, and the voices of students who have been, and staff members really, who have been really crying out for years. So. I thank you all, um, and I'm, again, grateful to the work that you guys have done and will continue to do. I look up to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Anabudo. <clears throat> At this time, we are up to agenda item 4.02, the third quarter budget review. I call on Dr. Brabrand for a short presentation. Actually, Chairman Anderson, we did the uh, third quarter, I, I was reviewing our notes that we did the third quarter presentation already at the last meeting, and then we had a work session and answered board questions. So I think tonight it's just uh, a vote on the motion. Thank you. Very well. Then I call on Ms. Marin for the motion. Yes, thank you. Just one moment, please. I move that the school board approve revenue and expenditure adjustments as reflected in the FY 2021 third quarter budget review and as detailed in the agenda item this evening. I Is there a second? <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Darna Koufax. Ms. Marin, would you like to speak to this motion? Yes, our board discussed this third quarter report of the current fiscal year 2021 budget this past Tuesday, March 16th keeping in mind that this report shouldn't be used to make assumptions or discussions about what lies ahead for finalizing the FY22 budget, which is now in development. There's still much up in the air about the fiscal year 22 budget development, including Board of Supervisors deliberations and our advocacy to them, state funding, and now two new allocations of federal funding. So it's, it's premature to view this third quarter discussion as a starting point for already balancing the to be determined fiscal year 22 budget. So um, it's uh, up to us to keep uh, keeping on top of this and waiting for other people's to fall in, pieces to fall into place before we can assess the status of this current fiscal year 2021 leading into fiscal year 22. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Ms. Dana Colfax, would you like to speak to your second? Just briefly, as Ms. Marin stated, we have had a presentation and then a work session on this, and I hope my colleagues um, will, re will approve this as detailed. Thank you. Any others wishing to speak? Ms. McLaughlin? Yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, briefly update my colleagues and uh, Dr. Braber and his team that 
Um, during the work session, we had expressed some concerns about um, some proposals about the uh, health care fund and how this division would handle uh, the $2 million uh, that we anticipate may be required to pay Innova Hospital for the vaccinations of our employees and how the health care fund actually 15 to 25 percent of contributions are coming from employees. Um, I do not have a motion at this time to change uh, the third quarter uh, review as proposed, but I would like to ask our CFO, Ms. Burden, if she could confirm that as we reach the fourth quarter uh, or year-end review, uh, would the, the decision about that $2 million coming out of the health care fund should we have greater clarity on our CARES Act monies, um, of which some of us uh, were discussing that that is certainly an expenditure dealing with COVID itself, uh, we could <coughs> ultimately pay for Innova um, it costs with our CARES money at a later date. So it's not like we're making a permanent decision as of now uh, with the, the the revenue uh, expended, I guess the re the revenue um, delta that we've got right now, where it's there's showing uh, an increase. So, Ms. Burden, are you with us? Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. I, Ms. Burden, please go ahead. Yes, I am with you, um, Ms. McLaughlin. Uh, certainly, we could we could do that. Um, I, I've I've found out some some new information uh, since we last spoke about this. Um, and and the, the fact is, is that the charges for the vaccinations, um, well, let me be clear, are, are free to, to all employees. There is no charge for it. But the claims for the vaccinations are actually coming in against the healthcare fund uh, by individual, each individual employee, for both Aetna and Care First. So these charges for this, um, for the vaccine are already um, uh, happening as claims against the healthcare fund. Um, it is something that we could likely revisit, um, but you know, we certainly would have difficulty um, trying to document individually um, the costs that would satisfy the, the grantor um, as far as documentation goes. And we're going to have to investigate that a little more fully, um, but the, the expenses for these claims are already occurring. Uh, thank you, Ms. Burton. I know it's been a long um evening and a long work day for staff um, already because the board started and closed at five o'clock. So I don't want to belabor this too much, but you are bringing up something that's really important. Uh, we are a self-funded um, healthcare system, correct? So, yes. So I'm trying with the exception, to, with the yeah. exception of Kaiser, which is fully funded. Sure. I mean, fully insured. And so their expenses um, don't, don't occur in their healthcare fund at all. So I'm trying to figure out because uh, even in, in my husband's company situation where it's a self-funded um, health healthcare system for their company, um, the, the charges typically go right to the self-funded employer. So why would we be paying Aetna? And, or are you telling me that employees are going and getting vaccinated in Nova and Nova is sending it to Aetna but why would we pay Aetna any money? Is Aetna paying Inova? And they're, just their, they're, they're, they're just our claims expenses for our employees that are covered. No, I know, but you brought up that things are already getting paid out, and I'm trying to figure out who's, who's paying them. If we're, the, if we're a self-funded program, then... You mentioned Aetna and was it Blue Cross or who? Care first, yeah. Yeah, Care, Care first. first mm -hmm. That they're already processing claims for these individual vaccines, 
And I, I, when you say processing the claims, who is there money being paid out? Are these bills being paid? And who's paying them? Aetna pays ANOVA, and we pay Aetna. That's very interesting. Well, I won't take up this evening. I will want to ask more questions because that doesn't follow what I understand a typical self-funded health care program does um, in, involving Aetna and Care First being a middleman. But uh, in any case, uh, I think what I'm hearing from you is if we determine from the federal government that they will consider the cost of COVID vaccines for our employees as a COVID-related eligible expense, then we could always replenish the health care fund as it's paid out $2 million to ANOVA. And the reason this all matters is because when the health care fund um, revenue goes down, that can ultimately impact employees' premiums on a year-to-year -year basis, correct? Yes, it can, but we can exclude the costs of this vaccine from future um, premium calculations okay. so that it does not have an impact. So I would, I would just say, Dr. Brabrand, um, I, I look forward to you, you and your team keeping the board apprised uh, so that we do make sure that our employees are held harmless uh, to this $2 million cost uh, for the COVID vaccines. And Ms. Burden, I do appreciate that there was a lot of, um, uh, of questions related to this at the work session and you are doing your best to answer them. Uh, but again, my concern is trying to mitigate impact on our employees, um, especially given uh, when we raise our premiums, that does in fact uh, affect them financially. So did I- Yeah, we can exclude. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Ms. Corbett Sanders. Yes, thank you, Dr. Anderson. I just wanted to personally thank Ms. Burden, uh, Ms. Marin, and Ms. Derenak Kofax for their work on this third quarter budget review and re recommending to the board the fiscally responsible thing to do of carrying over this money into next year's budget. We knew that we know that we we're going to have a challenging budget year because we know that the um, county as a whole is having a challenging budget year. And so making this fiscally responsible request of the board um, is very much appreciated and I will support this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other speakers to this motion? Seeing none, I will now call for the vote. The motion is before us on the screen. All those in favor? Ms. McLaughlin, Mr. Frisch, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Sizemore Heiser, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Pokarski, Ms. Marin, Ms. Omesh, Ms. Danak Koufax, Ms. Keys Gamara, Ms. Tolan, and myself. That is unanimous. Agenda item 4.03, school year 21-22 calendar. I call on Dr. Brabrand for a short presentation. Thank you, Chairman Anderson. We'll, uh uh, have a brief presentation on the calendar and then uh, be glad to uh, have the board m uh, move ahead with its motion for tonight. Uh, I want to share that tonight's meeting is the culmination of several meetings regarding next year's school calendar and I do appreciate all the time that the community, the school board and staff have devoted to ensuring our school calendar reflects the values of Fairfax County Public Schools. I do want to say in that vein, I want to acknowledge some key groundings up front as we begin this presentation tonight. I acknowledge that FCPS in our current calendars over the last several years have left many of our minority religious faith and cultural groups feeling not respected, not included, and not valued in our school system. I also want to say and I recognize that our current calendars have caused hurt and pain. We've heard that tonight from students and we've heard it from staff members where folks have felt that we have not accurately lifted up and elevated their voices and their perspectives um, and their face and cultural observances as we've done calendars year after year, even when we've provided guidance uh, to our schools and offices about 
how to handle those observances. So it is in that vein that we present uh, tonight. And as a reminder, uh, I am presenting a new draft calendar D to become a fourth option for the board alongside calendars A, B, and C. And the calendar D I'll be presenting responds to school board motions in March. But I do want to say that none of the calendars presented tonight, none of them except the past status quo, all are a change. We know that we can and must develop a more inclusive and pluralistic calendar to meet our uh, school's needs. We know calendars A and B were done before the pandemic with the Religious Observances Task Force uh, and focused on providing an additional four holidays for uh, those of uh, minority religious faith, as well as some cultural observances. We know that calendar C was done during the pandemic with the focus on the continuity of instruction uh, and decoupling spring break from Easter. And now I'll be presenting to you calendar D tonight, which reflects the work of the school board's motions um, over a work session around this topic that we've been working hard with staff to bring you our collective best thinking around how to take these motions and present a fourth option for the board. If I can go to the next slide, I want to say that that calendar option included in the board motion, um, legal considerations, instructional concerns, student wellness, support staff pay, absenteeism data, operational disruption, looking at staff days off and planning time, survey preferences, transparency and community climate, any and all equity considerations, inclusiveness, and the uh, consideration of the use of two floating holidays that could be used for religious observances or cultural celebrations. I do want to also show that was the motion on March 2nd. Um, there was also a follow-on motion on March for, uh, 4th around identifying religious and culturally significant days that could result in significant absenteeism and create regulations that do not currently exist for the manner in which FCPS would designate certain activities as impermissible that just simply would not be done on said days, just as the student was saying tonight. No test, no plays, no um, after-school activities, being specific about what would be allowed and what would not be allowed, um, so that the, there is not a negative impact on academic, social, and emotional well-being of students who engage in these observances. Tonight's Calendar D approach strives to also be equitable and inclusive, and, and it does decouple spring break from any religious and cultural observances. It would be the first week of April spring break, and it would follow the end of third quarter um, in next year's calendar. It is a calendar uh, that also seeks to respect, honor uh, the plurality of religious and cultural observances in our county. The religious and cultural observances identified in calendar D are based on uh, religions and cultural observances where the division averages for staff and students were above the uh, average uh, in terms of absences, uh, having that exceed that average of the division at least once over the past five years. We've also worked uh, with regulations and guidance for students and staff, and we've modified a draft regulation um, and elevated guidance into a regulation for our students and staff to be sure that religious and cultural observances would be given more explicit protections under these regulations, having specific activities that are impermissible. This will include strong protections to ensure that students and staff are not penalized in any way for observing these days. I want to invite our Equity, Chief Equity Officer, Dr. Lisa Williams, to talk a little bit more about the calendar highlights uh, and a little bit about moving forward. Dr. Williams. Good evening. So, as was outlined, the calendar was definitely created with all of the feedback in mind and centering our efforts around equity and access. And certainly our attempt here is to put forward an option that respects and honors the plurality of the organization. And moving forward, we will work together to develop a process that allows the board to establish the roles of staff, board members, and communities. We'll provide and offer clarity on criteria and, and priorities used to establish 
annual calendars, including recognition days for religious and cultural observances. Additionally, we'll think about and be very explicit in identifying the school board priorities for all and how and where feedback will and can be collected. Dr. Brabrand. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I think now uh, we're gonna turn to our Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Smith, who'll walk us through Calendar D uh, and uh, go over the highlights of Calendar D. Mr. So, Smith. Thank you, Dr. Brabrand. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair. Good evening, Board. Uh, Dr. Brabrand did an excellent job of going through the calendar this evening. So uh, he did actually take several of my points. Uh, but I do want to uh, share a few of the highlights for the religious and cultural observances that we've added to the calendar. I have to add that our human resources staff did uh, extensive uh, research on global cultural observances and did the overlay for those uh, absences that we had for students and staff. And we identified in the month of July, uh, Eid al Adha as uh, uh, one of our religious and cultural observances. In September, uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. In November, Diwali. In December, Bodhi Day. In January, Three Kings Day and Epiphany. Uh, also Orthodox Christmas and Orthodox Epiphany. Uh, for February, we've identified Lunar New Year. Uh, for April, Good Friday and Orthodox Good Friday and the last day of Passover. And in May, Eid al-Fatur. Uh, we've also identified some observances that are not on the 2021-22 calendar, uh, yet will be placed on the calendar when those days uh, actually fall during the school week. And that would be in November, uh, the uh, November 1st and 2nd, Dia de los Muertos, uh, also uh, All Souls Day. Uh, April 3rd is Ramadan, beginning at sunset, and April 16th, Theravada, uh, which is a Buddhist New Year. Uh, we've heard tonight from our community. We've heard from our community in emails. We've heard from our board members about uh, our previous guidance around uh, teachers and schools not scheduling certain activities uh, during specific holidays. And uh, with the new draft regulation that we're going to provide the board uh, to review, Regulation 2234 outlines uh, certain things that schools shall not schedule and certain activities that the division shall not schedule. And for schools, it's new graded assignments or activities, tests, quizzes, or other assessments, field trips, school pictures, or assemblies, sporting events, school-sponsored special events and activities such as prom and back-to-school nights, and auditions or tryouts that cannot be rescheduled. And with regard to the division, uh, we shall not schedule division-wide special events such as graduation, first day of school, centralized tests or other assessments, recruiting and hiring events, professional development activities or other conferences, and town halls or other, and other community events. And I think the biggest difference between our previous guidance that we shared and this regulation is that uh, we will actually have a certification process where uh, different layers of individuals in the organization will be certifying that our calendars are free from activities on these days. Starting at the school level uh, with our team leads and our administrators, all the way through our region offices, and then for the division level, uh, again, beginning with our program managers, going all the way through our chiefs and the deputy superintendent. Uh, so that is a key piece that is very different from the previous guidance that we would share quarterly uh, that will uh, not only hold our schools and teachers avail uh, accountable, but hold ourselves as an entire school division accountable for making sure that we uh, recognize uh, these days for our students and families. And we also provided some information uh, in the posting for a draft regulation for Regulation 4817. Uh, what's unchanged in that regulation for staff as they recognize uh, our religious and cultural observances is that in addition to using annual leave, personal leave, and or leave without pay, employees may make up a maximum of 16 hours of religious leave annually. That is unchanged. The changed aspect of that regulation uh, it would be that principals or program managers may not deny this leave for our staff. 
Uh, and these regulations are currently in draft format. We're going to continue to work with our stakeholders to refine, to ensure uh, that we meet the needs of our students and staff uh, as they uh, observe uh, those rights that are most holy to them. And with that, I turn it back over. So thank you, Mr. Smith, and that's our presentation. We'll be glad to take any questions or we'll leave it for the board for uh, further action as appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I will call on Ms. McLaughlin for the motion. Yes, thank you. I'm just trying to get that pulled up here. Okay, the uh, first motion is that the way it's listed. Okay, uh, I move that the board adopt a calendar. The way this is you, listed. Ms. McLaughlin, I apologize. Yeah. If I can ask for a pause before yeah. I call on you for the motion, I believe there are some inquiries from board members. So yeah. I will go ahead and have um, those questions be responded to and then call on you for the motion. Yeah, I'm looking at what's posted here and I'll be perfectly honest, I don't see the language specifically posted. I see the recommendation and then I see proposed amendments, but I do not see the main motion. So while so, we take the questions, perhaps the clerk can assist with that. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. School board members, I will now take questions. So if you are interested, please go ahead and raise your hands at this time. Ms. Sizemore-Heiser. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Brabrand, I have a question. As your team developed Calendar D, or maybe Mr. Smith, whoever can answer this, did you um, ask our school-based staff, our principals and teachers, whether they could actually um, implement okay. all of these days and the night before without some all of these events and tests and things that you're talking about and still get them all in in a school year? So as part of the process, we, we note that the regulations are still in draft format. And so we've identified the items that we want to use as that base language moving forward. Uh, we did pull together a team of individuals that range from uh, our region assistant superintendents and EPs, uh, also working very closely with our activities office. Uh, to identify the types of activities uh, that we would be looking at. And then as part of this process moving forward, how we operationalize, uh, we will be engaging to have those conversations. So if I understood you correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you, you listed our EPs and our activities. Those are central office staff, am I correct? That is correct. So did you ask any principals, building principals or building staff, whether, I'm asking this because we've heard testimony tonight and we've heard testimony in many of my stakeholder meetings. I've heard concern about the fidelity of implementation of our regulations and guidelines in the past, and we heard it tonight. So did you ask any building level principals and staff before drafting that regulation or revising it, I should say, whether they thought they could actually implement this and still do all the things they need to do in a school year and, or want to do in a school year? No, no, we did not. Uh, and again, we uh, have planned to have those conversations with our staff about the operationalizing of these particular regulations uh, and uh, the, trying to figure out the best ways to do that. We felt that the key piece here and the differentiation was the certification process uh, to ensure that uh, these activities were not scheduled on these days. Ms. Heisman-Heiser, if I could, though, share, I, I did get a chance to talk to high school principals today. And I want to say this in full candor. We've had guidance around this for over 25 years. I came in as an intern in 1993, and we were told not to have tests on certain days, including Yom Kippur um, and Rosh Hashanah. I know for a fact in the 90s that was the case. What we have is our community year after year decade after decade feeling that that guidance isn't followed. How do we live the equity that we're talking about? So part of the reality is we're moving guidance into and elevating it into a regulation and we're building in, as Mr. Smith said, um, a review process, a confirmation process that the activities scheduled in the school are going to follow this. 
and we need to do a better job with whatever calendar we ultimately select, this board selects. We have to do a better job of living what we value um, and making sure that we're doing the follow-up because there's too many stories like you've heard in the emails and the calls over too many years and that's why we've gotten to where we are with so much um, so much emotion around this as people have not felt included and respected as they've had their special days um, not given the respect um, and value that they need to have here in Fairfax County Public Schools. So I appreciate that, that answer, Dr. Barry Brown, but I think I'm asking a slightly different question. What I'm asking is not why haven't we done it or you know, what the guidelines for regulations and what I'm asking is, can we actually do this with all of the tests, assessments, plays, sporting events, and other events that happen in particular at a high school, we're looking at 30 days, 30 days in a calendar year, school trips, can we actually do this? Well, it's our, we, we would certainly strive to do it. And I think one of the things that maybe uh, wasn't clear, and this is a draft regulation, we're taking a final look at it. You may have feedback, uh, uh, our principals may have feedback. As you know, this motion just was shared a week or two ago. We had a week to turn around a fourth calendar option. Um, but we're really talking about the impermissible activities on the day of not the day after or the day before. So I think there was some confusion. There was maybe an early draft that talked about something being before or after, but we're talking about in impermissible activities on the day of, that O on the calendar. And, and I would also share that as we're thinking about those uh, activities the day after, as we operationalize, uh, for those tests that would be given the day after, we would certainly operationalize that those tests or assessments would be given prior to any religious observance, religious or cultural observance, so that students wouldn't be disadvantaged uh, nor penalized for not being there for any type of review or having to take a test the day after they come back. And so that's part of uh, the discussions that we would have so that we can minimize the impact of uh, disruptions uh, to the instructional program, uh, but also uh, ensure that that, that we provide at the, the time necessary for students and staff to uh, observe their uh, religious and cultural days. All right, well, I just would post that if we haven't been able to do it so far with the days that we've had, I think this is gonna be very difficult to do with some fidelity of implementation, and I think it's gonna perpetuate some of the hurt that we talked about, but that's my two cents. Thank you for answering my question, I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sizemore-Heiser, Ms. Omesh. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Smith, for your hard work on this. I understand you're following instruction for much of this. Um, I, I did have a question about what you shared on the regulation. So I, I obviously appreciate that there's, we removed approval, which really should have never been there, the process, I mean. Um, what, can you please speak more to the makeup policy situation, why that wasn't changed and what the rationale is there? The, so, so in terms of the makeup policy, we didn't address any makeup policy because we've built into the regulation that there would be no new graded, uh, no new graded assessments or, or assignments on our religious and cultural observance days. Uh, so there would be no need for a makeup for those days because we would not ask our teachers to uh, assign any new work for those particular days. I'm sorry, so to clarify, you were referring to students and not employees. I was, oh yes, I was referring to students. With regard to employees, uh, we felt that we heard from the board there during our uh, discussions with the board uh, that uh, there may be different options for staff. And so for the makeup days, we wanted to provide the same types of options that we had available for staff currently uh, one of the things that we did hear from uh, many emails that I received from staff uh, was this notion of uh, not uh, being able to take these days or at least having those days uh, denied by the supervisor. Right, so you adjusted the, the fact that they have to ask their supervisor for approval, right? But the piece where they're having to make up and whatnot, what was the rationale in not changing that? Because we're offering other options for staff, so staff can take personal leave, staff can take uh, their own leave if they choose to. 
uh, for those days, in addition to doing the makeup day with the 16 hours. And so we're providing staff options for taking those days versus just uh, a, a blanket day. The, the other piece, um, uh, it, it allows flexibility for staff who choose to uh, observe those days differently. How so? It provides uh, the flexibility because there are staff who would choose to uh, do the makeup if they would go beyond the 16 hours or make up the 16 hours. Uh, we've had staff in the past who uh, have chosen to take those days on their own. We've had staff who've chosen to take uh, their own leave for those days. And so we felt that it was important to leave that piece of the regulation in place. Okay, um, so to clarify, you're saying this, they have to make up 16 hours for taking this day? What I'm saying is that there are up to 16 hours that staff can take for religious and cultural observances uh, as it's currently written in the regulation. Uh, and they also have other days available to them uh, for leave if they choose to take those days. Okay. Um, Let's take the example of an hourly employee. How much time do they have to make this up? So with regard to an hourly employee um, taking this leave, can, can you be more specific in terms of uh, how much time they would have to make it up? So you're saying they would have to make up these hours, right? What time frame do they have to make it up by? Because my understanding is the policy it has a very short turnaround and it's quite unreasonable, especially for hourly employees. So that's my point of confusion here as to why we wouldn't have modified that. Or if I'm misunderstanding what was modified. So the, the biggest piece that was modified for the regulation is that we took away uh, the ability for a program manager to deny leave for an individual. But we were hearing that staff members were wanting to take leave. They uh, were not allowed to take leave in some instances, and so we wanted to make sure that staff members would have the ability to take that leave without a program manager saying no. Right, which is the, again, the approval part, but we're still stuck on this makeup policy. I, I do have a question actually for the chair. I mean, in terms of po procedure now, does this come to governance for further discussion as a, as a new policy? Or a regulation, I suppose, under a policy? Is this a regulation, uh, Mr. Smith? So these are regulations, and we're, we're certainly, the regulations are in draft format right now, and so as we have any additional feedback from the board or any additional feedback from our staff around those regulations, we can certainly take that into consideration. Yeah, I, I was surprised to hear today that that wasn't modified. I think, you know, that, that that's one of the places we can certainly add. I'd love to see that myself, and it was the whole purpose behind my forum topic to begin with. Um, I wanted to ask about the flex days as well. So this calendar that we have posted here, it's posted on board docs. Um, where else, where does this calendar go after this? So the calendar is posted on board docs. So, so you got a question about what, what we had originally referred to as flex days that we're now calling religious and cultural observances. Is that the question? Yeah. And then in terms of where the calendar goes, once the uh, board approves a particular calendar, it goes back to the uh, D Department of Human Resources so that we can use this student calendar to develop the employee calendar. Okay, I mean, I just wanna be very clear that as schools are planning, they're not going into board docs or to the HR to see this calendar to right. have an understanding of what days to avoid. Mr. So, so, Mesh, what, so if, I, if I might, Mr. Uh, Smith. Mr. Smith, what, what, can you just be a little bit clearer in terms of what typically happens once the board, uh, once the board approves a calendar? What yeah. is developed and what is that typical time frame? And I know we're a little bit off from that this year, but what you expect to happen after the board makes a decision? Yeah, so it, ta it normally takes about four to six weeks for us to develop the employee calendar after that. And then once we get all of that developed, we post all of that information on our website for our families. It's shared uh, through the news you choose so that we inform the entire community. And then uh, we will be working on the oper operationalizing of our regulations so that we can work very closely with our um, program managers and our principals uh, to ensure that as they develop their calendars for next year, 
that they are not planning activities on these particular days that were previously called flex days and are now religious and cultural observances. Okay, in terms of how we're posting it and who's seeing it, I mean, I've seen the previous ones. We've included these holidays before, M many of them, not all of them. Um, and uh, Dr. Rayburn, I know you referred to the, ni you know, the 90s as being when, when things were on there, but in 2019, as I've a broken record here, we had literally graduation on a holiday that's been posted. So I'm trying to have an understanding of how this is gonna be different. What are we doing in terms of posting this, using it, is it going to be in professional development when we train our teachers at the beginning of the year? I mean, how are we really going to make sure that people know this? So the biggest difference with the, what we currently do. So currently we provide guidance and a notice quarterly uh, with particular dates that we would ask our schools to shy away from. And, and it's, it's that strong, that's how strong the language is. And so there's really no teeth to our current language other than please uh, uh, avoid these particular days as you're planning uh, and then please share your calendars with the community well in advance so that they can plan and prepare and, and, and that has literally been the guidance that we've been sharing with our schools. Well, what we are talking about here is creating and developing uh, a process where those uh, calendars would have to be approved uh, at the school level by the school-based administration then approved at the region level. And then for any of those division-wide activities, those would all have to be approved through the chiefs and the deputy superintendent, which is a, a, a huge departure for what we're doing now. Okay, um, final question. Uh, regarding the survey data, I know we rely on that in terms of determining what you know, makes sense for our community. Are we looking at, for next year, adding these as question points for the survey? So uh, as, as Dr. Williams said, we will be working as chiefs to develop that process. And so we, we would certainly want to engage the community in any process that we use moving forward. And surveys is one of the best ways that we can get information from our community. Right, because we didn't include any of these this year, right? So that, that would have to be a change. Didn't include any, I'm sorry. Of the religious or cultural observances in the survey? There, there were no uh, questions about religious and cultural observances in the survey this year, you're correct. Okay, I mean, I think these are clear steps forward. Um, I'll, I'll reserve my time, I know this was for questions. But. Ms. Lomesh, if I could just add uh, to the response. Uh, you asked the question, of the question about how will staff and the community know with whatever calendar is adopted tonight, there clearly needs to be a communication and a professional development plan that goes along with that calendar in multiple languages and ways of um, sharing that with our families. And of course, professional development with our staff and work with principals around the um, the regulation and and most importantly the operationalization of the count of the new calendar no I appreciate that I mean can't be business as usual right we know that's brought us you know outcomes that are not what we're looking for so we can't just expect that to bring something different so I do appreciate that thank you thank you Ms. Omesh Ms. Corbett Sanders Yes, thank you. And I really appreciate the uh, questions that have been posed thus far because this is a totally new approach to how we would uh, approach a regulation versus guidelines, have enforceability, checks and balances with having the certification done, both at the building level, at the regional level, and then somewhere at um, Gatehouse. Is that correct? That is correct. So that's a game changer. Because when you measure things, then you, it shows that you value them and that you have certain expectations. Um, Dr. Brabrand, have you spent any time with the principals at all? You started to say something earlier and got cut off, so I just wanted to hear from I, you. I met with the high school principals today. We, we've had so many things going on, but I did meet with them today. They did have some concerns, as Ms. Sizemore-Heiser said, how are we gonna do this? this? This is a lot. 
The reality is, though, the expectation of around certain days, we've shared his guidance for years. And we're here because we've elevated equity in our conversation as a board and as a superintendent and leadership team. And our community doesn't see the actions at the classroom level in some cases or school level in some cases. We're not saying that this happens across the board, but it happens too much. It's not been consistent enough. And we have to have a new, bolder, different approach to ensure we're doing a better job. And what I brought based on the motions that the board provided uh, just a week ago or two weeks ago, week and a half ago, um, is trying to bring together um, through all of those elements in your motion something that elevates this, uh, not only on the calendar by creating these O days, but also elevates it from guidance to a regulation with, um, with layers of review at the school region and then at the division level. See, I think that's really important. And I also think it's important that when we engage with what the um, next steps are going forward here, and I know that they've been encapsulated in a follow-on motion by some of my colleagues, it's really important to actually go out into the community and meet in the community about these issues. And it's not just one community, because when we look at the um, religious observances, there are quite a few, and many of them weren't represented in the task force or in the um, calendar committee. So I think that having that inclusive approach, but a, an approach where, meet, where we meet people where they're at, rather than them uh, expecting them to come to us is gonna be so important. I wanna also tag on to the comment that Ms. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Omish mentioned because it was something that I raised to you and to uh, Mr. Smith in an email which was a concern about making sure that our teachers aren't squeezed in um, their ability to pursue their religious observances because as you know we've got multiple religions here that are in uh, and that have not been represented in the past and people have had to take days off um, and have felt stress over having to do the pre-planning and find their own um, substitutes and if they didn't find a substitute. So the fact that they can no longer be denied their opportunity to take their uh, religious observance day off is a huge step. But I'm wondering why we haven't also looked at utilizing more admin leave as being one of those um, possibilities. And the reason I say this is that in my, the response to my question, I was told, well, there could be a quite significant number. But with the calendar D that was presented today, the likelihood of huge spikes on, indi on individual days really is dependent on the representation of those um, groups in our community. And so it's one or 2% here and there rather than a, the total school system on each one of these days. Is that correct? Yeah, I, what, what I'd say is I think it's definitely something as represented in the following motion that I could have the three chiefs look at in more detail, understand mm -hmm. what the cost would be to provide something beyond the current days that we have, the 16 hours makeup, um, and we don't have that for you tonight, but we could do it as a follow on and, and look at it. And, and it's a careful balance. It's a careful balance that we've got to figure out, but we'd be glad to, to do that and help inform the board uh, moving forward. And I certainly didn't expect you to have that answer tonight, but I just wanted to give some context and also to follow up on Ms. Omesha's comment because I think that's what she was driving towards. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you, I wanna pick up on a couple things that uh, my colleagues have brought up because I think they're important. Uh, first of all, Dr. Brabrand, I really appreciate that in our time together, what I know about you is a, a genuine desire to continuously improve. And as you have, and this board and our community has reflected deeply about what our traditional calendar has looked like and where we are in present day Fairfax County has changed much over the last 25 years. And, and so we want to lean in and better understand what it means to be in such a diverse uh, county. Um, but I also want to emphasize that um, 
As a school division, we also humbly know that there are other areas that we have to continuously improve on. We have to work on fidelity of implementation and adherence. Uh, everyone knows when we talk to our special education communities, school by school, teacher by teacher, it can vary on they're doing it with fidelity of excellence and then unfortunately not as much. And so I would say to my colleagues that uh, without question, we have to uh, have a commitment as a board uh, working in partnership with the superintendent uh, to have this type of accountability uh, related to our religious observances and cultural observances uh, and to continue this dialogue with our community in terms of hearing from our families where those uh, challenges that they've experienced. Um, and I have certainly in my time on the board, uh, this is a year more than ever um, that I am finally hearing some of the stories, families coming forward. So I think uh, what we are becoming aware of is how many families were suffering in silence and not thinking that um, the system cared uh, or that we were mindful of it. And so I hope that this uh, can be considered a positive. I also want to point out that um, Dr. Brabrand, as many of us talk about the mental health and well-being of our students, uh, we hear uh, what it is like for our religious students to feel they have to choose between the love of their uh, religious observances and time to do that with their families and fear of missing school. Uh, and I would say from my own experience growing up in public school to what I watched my three sons here in Fairfax County and it's all over the country, we are hearing record levels of stress. Students are being tested more than ever. Um, they are finding it as a high stakes game to miss school, um, not simply for religious observances. They're afraid to miss school when they're sick. They're afraid to miss school uh, because they've had uh, you know, a, a doctor's appointment that they need and must go to. And the students talk about what that's like. Um, and, and, I, and our employees go through it too. So I think that this is broadening our awareness that we have to talk about not just being sensitive um, on this issue, but the work climate for students and, and, and our employees in general. Thank you very much, Ms. McLaughlin. Dr. Brabrand, did you want to respond to any of Ms. McLaughlin's comments? No, thank you very much. We are, we are committed to continuous improvement, including on the calendar piece. We have to do better. We know that. And uh, this is our collective work and we're working to do that in partnership with you all. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Tolan. Um, just very quickly, um, I'm happy to follow um, Ms. McLaughlin. Um, I definitely appreciate the um, fact that no matter what calendar we're moving forward with, um, we're going to have, you know, as Dr. Rayburn pointed out, all of these calendars, all of the proposals um, are new and different. And so I'm excited about the, um, the new regulations and what those, uh, the promise that those hold, um, but accountability and fidelity of implementation will be really key with those um, across the district. So we really do need to pay attention to that. Um, just quickly, I wanted to follow up on one of the questions that um, Ms. Omesh had. I think um, Mr. Smith, when she was talking about uh, the timing um, for staff to make up, you know, any hours that they take off, I think the differences for um, if you have hourly employees and they're paid every two weeks versus people that are paid monthly, like what is the time frame within which people have to make those hours up? And then, you know, let's say the, the, the holiday is on a Thursday and the pay period ends on Friday, you know, it may be difficult for an hourly employee to make up that time in, a, in that short time span. So that might be something we want to take a look at in the regulation is, um, you know, if we can be um, a little bit more forgiving as to um, when those hours need to be made up. Mr. Smith. So Ms. Tolan, thank you. Uh, so there are uh, some compliance issues with FSLA that we have to uh, adhere to. And so when we have work that's made up, it's generally made up, it must be made up within that, that next week or, or, or within the week. So it's not something that we could provide 
a, a little more flexibility, uh, we would be out of compliance if we did that. I see. Thank you. But Thank you. let me just clarify. If it's a two-week, week, they could do it ahead of time. They could make up the time ahead of time, right? The, as long as it's in the pay period. So, so I, I would ask uh, Mr. McDonald to, to chime in, but from what I know, uh, the work must be made up within the week uh, that, the, that the leave is taken. I say thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Ms. Cohen. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to say too that Dr. Berman, you had just referenced that potentially you know, by class or by school, but I just wanted to remind everybody that two years ago we gave the division-wide cognitive abilities testing on Jewish high holidays. So, you know, this is not teacher specific. This is not even necessarily school specific. We have some division-wide culpability as well. Um, you know, I guess one of my first reminders too is that the night before for many of our, our especially our Jewish holidays, but the observances begin the night before. So I just wanna be sure that we're recognizing when we're talking about after school activities, that the night before is when, at sundown, is when um, that actual holiday begins and then lasts until sundown the next day, unless it's Rosh Hashanah, which actually exists for many people um, for two days. So um, I guess a couple questions that I just wanted to ask. One is, um, are we going to be adding an absent for absent for religious observance code in CIS? Mrs. Smith? So at this point, we were, we're not going to add an absent for religious purposes or religious observances in CIS. Uh, and from the guidance that we've received from Division Council, we don't want to necessarily be in the business of asking students uh, to denote uh, particular uh, religious days off. And so by creating these religious observance days, we are blocking out days where activities uh, would not have to be held. And if students were then absent on those days, uh, they uh, wouldn't be held accountable for the work that was done on those particular days. Right, but we can't say that we're collecting data about student absences if we are not actually collecting data about student absences resulting in religious observance. I'm so sorry, you're behind me. I hate that I'm not that, looking at you while I'm talking to you. That's okay, that's okay. No, the, the data that we've provided the board has really been about overall absences because we don't have a way uh, to separate out that information as to whether or not the absent was taken for uh, religious purposes or not. Right, but then the data we were given was not even parsed out between here's a normal you know, absentee rate on the day before winter break or the day after winter break. Winter break. I, I'm, I'm just confused about how we talk about trying to gather data when people, I'm not asking that we ask people um, if they're taking off for religious observance. I will say every time I've called in for my children, I say my children will be absent today because we are observing Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, but to find out that that information just goes into the vast nothingness and is not something um, that's used to inform our decision making about how many people are actually out on that day, I, I just, I find that very difficult in trying to understand that we're using data informed decision making, but we are not collecting the data. Um, my next question is, you know, I, I'm just wondering in creating calendar D, who was involved in that creation and how was the decision made not to add any holidays, even with the absentee data that we had? Dr. Boybrand, would you please speak to that? Sure, I mean, Mr. Smith can speak to the process. We had a calendar team, as he said, with RAS and EPs and people from the activities office. Um, we pulled data from the last five years, looked at division average for absences and then look for days where it exceeded it within the last five years. And we found these days that are now labeled O, where absences by either staff or students exceeded the average uh, for the division uh, on those, um, what I believe are 15 days. Um, and Mr. Smith, would you add anything else to that? 
No, no, you've covered it well. And that work uh, normally falls uh, to human resources to pull that work together and actually develop the calendar, uh, which was then reviewed by uh, members of senior leadership and cabinet. And then my last question is, what is what's the reporting structure if we're collecting data um, about violations of this regulation? What is the reporting structure for students and families um, if there is a violation of, of this regulation? Mr. Smith? So students will have the ability to appeal. So as written currently into the regulation that if they feel that uh, their school has not uh, uh, that they that has not satisfactorily uh, met that student's needs that that student can appeal to the principal uh, and family can appeal to the principal and can also appeal to the region office uh, all the way through the to the division or to the deputy superintendent so we're concerned about not collecting sys data because we don't want to have people signaled out for their religion but then we're asking students to then identify themselves as members of that religion to then appeal to the principal. We were asking families to do that, yes. So forgive my confusion, but I'm confused about how on a phone system, collecting absentee data to use to inform our decision making is somehow more offensive than asking families within a power structure to go up the chain of command. I'm just confused. We talk all the time about power dynamics and how we're trying to embrace the system, but instead of even an anonymous structure where we collect data or potentially using our ombudsman so at least there can be um, anonymous appeals. I just, I'm just confused about how what we're presenting in version D, excuse me, is better than what we have now for our kids. So version D represents work from what this board had a week or two ago in motions and asked us to do. Um, it more clearly puts on this calendar designated days, which we've labeled O. It has an accompanying regulation, which didn't exist before. We had guidance. We had something that might go out in a memo or a letter or a reminder versus a regulation. We have the structures that Mr. Smith talked about being formed at the school level, the, uh, the RAS or the regional assistant superintendent level and division um, that are going to ensure a review of these schedules to see that there aren't conflicts. Can I promise you right now that in every single school we're gonna do it perfect? We haven't done it perfect before and I can't promise you today that we'll, we'll be 100% perfect, but we need to be better and this is a step in getting better and elevating the in the consciousness of everyone in our system there are many cultural and religious observances that our staff and students have participated in want to participate in and we need to be thinking about that as we're an ongoing school district and school division um, and one thing that i think has come out of this process which I, as I acknowledged up front, has been painful for many, for many years, is the diversity is even greater than we imagined among religious faiths and cultural observances where people have made decisions quietly maybe sometimes to, to step away from, from their work or from, from their studies. Um, and we have, we've done the deeper data dive to show that, and we should have done it earlier. We should have done it earlier. We didn't. We've done it now. And calendar D represents that data review and these days that come above the division average for absences. Thank you, Dr. Braybrand. I believe Dr. Williams also would like to address this question. Dr. Williams? Yes. Um, thank you for the recognition. Um, because I think that you're asking a very deep and meaningful question, Ms. Cohen. Um, and, and here is my response. 
what I would submit is going to ultimately um, make this the better decision is our commitment to move forward to do the work that is inclusive and raises awareness of the diversity of the organization. There are no shortcuts to that, right? There are no shortcuts to how we learn to appreciate traditions, rituals, ways of being in the world that are different than ours, except to lean in. I think that this moment um, in, in making this decision has brought us face to face um, with the need to, to actually not only put in place those pieces of accountability that arguably, you know, we can talk about those um, mechanisms having been in place before. But I think what we have that is different now is a level of consciousness about what it takes to actually do the work in earnest. Because of all of the feedback from the community, because of the constant. Dr. Williams, we're losing you a little bit. So if you wouldn't mind repeating the last two statements. Um, that takes us in decision making process new and different. And so that Dr. Williams, your sound is not working very well. You are freezing and we are missing your statements. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll turn off my camera and see if that helps. Thank you. Please start again from your last couple of statements because we missed that information. Can you hear me okay now? Can you hear me better? Yes. Okay. Um, what I was offering is that I, I would offer that our consciousness about what it means to have this regulation in place and, and what it means in terms of doing the work to help us value and appreciate is what is different um, as we move forward. You, you can put a regulation in place but if you don't change the consciousness around how staff engages that regulation, then you absolutely get the same outcomes. And the con conversations that we've had, um, the feedback that we've gotten from the community, the challenges that we've even had as a team making body, uh, Albert Proffer put us in a, at a different level of awareness to move forward than we have in the past. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge the question um, with the level of depth that, that I hear in the question in terms of challenge as to what would be different. Um, so those are my. Thank you very much, Dr. Williams. Um, Ms. Bukarski, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Braybrand and staff for uh, the observances, the way they were put on the calendar. I will say that I personally learned um, <laughs> about a few that I, I did not know. And what really struck me was just, as Ms. Uh, Sizemore-Heiser said, the number. We are such a diverse community and our students, um, uh, you know, have so many faiths and, and cultural observances and celebrations that matter. And I think uh, matter for us to recognize, I realize fidelity of implementation will be ultimately, um, you know, at the, at the end of the day. But I think this goes further than anything um, has ever done before. And I will say as a child of a faith, that is a minority faith um, who did, uh, you know, have, have unkind comments said to me during some of my uh, religious holidays that I, I went to school. I never thought mine would ever show up on a calendar like this. And, and I can only speak for myself, but I find it meaningful. Um, to educate others. So I appreciate that. And um, going back to the data for, um, for CIS, can Mr. Foster just give some clarity around the legality of that? And can we do that? Um, Mr. Foster? Right. So if I understood the question correctly, uh, Ms. Pekarski, is can we collect religious data in CIS? Yes, yeah, so we had the, the short answer is um, 
N no, we need to be very careful about that. And my office has looked very closely at that on, um, you know, individual students and, and religion. Um, you know, we have, we can take surveys that are voluntary, but um, having it, you know, included in this, no. Okay, thank you. Um, that is all. Thank you. I do apologize, Ms. Cohen. I think I moved on to the next speaker after Dr. Williams's comments. You did have some more time and some more inquiries. So please go ahead and then I will take my turn. No, I, I just wanted to ask, Dr. Brabrand didn't answer the question about how the decision was made to remove any holidays from version D after our, our um, work session. To remove any holidays? How, how, to not include, I'm sorry, to not include any of the dates, the holidays as days off in version D. Oh, the, the days off. Well, what we did is we went back and looked at the data and we found the days that averaged. And I guess you could say, well, is there a cut point at which some would be holidays and others would just be O's? And, and, and perhaps that's a further discussion, but I didn't think in two weeks' time I had the ability to bring forth something that I could support in front of this community and this board if that's something as part of the follow-on that you asked me to look at. But I, I didn't feel that I could bring something and say, well, what's that cutoff? And what's it mean to those that are getting the H or getting the O? I think something I just want to say from my heart, what we have here is people not feeling respected. We may be able to ultimately give 15 holidays and we could still have a school system where people don't feel respected and included. And I think we've got to start to take a deeper dive in our souls about our daily interactions with people and how do we do it. Maybe it's a division that does 15 holidays, but that still doesn't mean we're a division that's inclusive. So um, I think the calendar is a symptom of a deeper cause, and that's us fully embracing equity and being prepared to say where we've fallen short on it. And, you know, one of the things, too, is it's okay to say it's not okay, and it's not okay everything we've done as a school system. That doesn't mean we're not a premier school district, but it takes courage to say where you're not great at everything, and we've not done a great job around religious and cultural observances over many, many years, and people uh, have been fed up for a long time, and in this elevated moment of justice, of a pandemic that's made inequity even worse, People want to see change, not status quo. Every calendar before you now is not a status quo calendar, nor is calendar D. Thanks. I just wanted to say respectfully, I think it's less about being respected than it is about not being penalized for being a religious minority. That's the end of my questions. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Thank you very much. I do see some hands that have just come up in the um, chat with our virtual participants. So I will go there and then I will take my turn. Ms. Darnock Koufax, and then we will have Mr. Anabudo. Yes, I, I guess uh, the just previous conversation between my colleague, Ms. Cohen, and Dr. Brabrand just have sparked some of my questions. And I do respect Dr. Brabrand that there was a short amount of time, but I think that is one of the, the concerns that I have as we choose um, to add more holidays onto the calendar, have you determined yet what will be the measurements? Um, you know, as to, as to how they will be added, because I think that's the part right now that we don't have a clear understanding on um, because um, that, that, that's the hardest part right now. But have you talked about that at all or have you done anything or do you feel that that needs a broader conversation? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a broader conversation. And just to be clear, version D didn't add, and Mr. Smith, correct me, version D didn't add any additional holidays. We added O's, observances. We didn't add any additional holidays, did we, Mr. Smith? Correct. We, we added the religious and cultural observances. Right. And calendars A and B had four holidays right. added that were specific days. So we didn't add any additional holidays. And then the discussion that Ms. Cohen said was, well, wanted, you know, what would be the trigger to become a holiday? And I just said in the short period of time, that could be something we would look at at a follow-on, but I, I didn't feel comfortable 
that there was a dividing line between any of these in terms of excessive absences to draw a distinction between it becoming a holiday versus being a O or observance day? Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and I do, um, the regulations, they sound like um, we may need some tweaking and we may need some additional, but we have some time to do that, right? We have time because this calendar won't begin until, um, you know, the next school year, a few months from now. So we will have some time. That's to, correct, Ms. Dernat Kofax. We're, we were planning to just share the draft tonight, do some more work with stakeholders, and then bring a final draft of the regulation uh, prior to the board's recess by the end of July so that we're prepared to implement that regulation fully in the fall for the next school year. I, I think that will that's that's important. And I didn't mean to confuse you. I obviously know that in calendar D there were no holidays at it. I was talking about those other the other A and B calendars which were on there and that's um the measurements, I, I was unsure of how those came to be. So I think those are things that we need to talk about. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nakofax. Mr. Anubudo. Good evening, um, everyone. I just, um, I think everyone has touched on the main points um, that I think are problematic in everyone everyone I think agrees on the points about how fidelity, how fidelity of implementation will be a key factor in whether an option like D will even be, um, will even make a difference. Um, I think that that has been hit home really hard. I, I raised my hand and I felt I needed to speak because while, you know, I don't think D is everything. I don't think that D fully recognizes the needs of students and families. I do, I think, recognize that sometimes change um, and progress can needs to be slow and steady and measured and intentional. Um, and I see that, and I think that D is progress from where we've been before um, to an extent. Um, and I think that the part of me that made me realize that um, is maybe uh, Dr. Williams' words about raising the profile, because I think that right now we're in a stage where we're, we're hearing and we're listening and we're observing. And as a Christian myself, that work is done on my end as well. And I think what um, we are all noticing and recognizing is that there needs to be work done within the school system to recognize these holidays on an, inter on an internal level with the majority of students who don't recognize them as well. So I guess my question is, I don't know where the legal stand on this or what the operation operationalizing this would mean, um, but is there work for maybe some of these observances? Because these days aren't just technically missing a holiday for students, it's being told that, you know, my friends are going to get together on that day at school and they're going to have to get, get to, you know, hang out and talk and do whatever. And, you know, I'm not going to be there for that. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a cognitive load on students as well. Um, and it's being told that, you know, my particular day isn't as important, right? We talked about that aspect of it too. So maybe to mitigate some of that, I don't know, again, if this is going to be feasible legally, but maybe there's for these religious observance days if D is what ends up moving forward as a system has there been talk about using time in school to maybe educate kids about what our community members will be observing that day what this holiday is what is it about and what does it mean for certain members of our community so that students are being you know aware are made culturally aware of what their peers and others who don't worship or believe in the same exact way as they do um what they may be in partaking in because i think um, maybe that's a step that we can use to further this conversation and, you know, in increase, increase our view of the plural pluralist pluralistic way in which our county functions. Nathan, I definitely think the communication of the calendar uh, definitely needs to elevate education and awareness at every level, at the student level, the teacher level, the school administrator level, the central office level. Um, all of it and um, I think that's a great idea and we will absolutely uh, work to do that the three chiefs as I said will be working uh, I believe on the follow-on motion that the board will make uh, but we can also talk about how we communicate the approved calendar that the board approves tonight clearly at every level in the organization including uh, elevating and uh, building that understanding for students of what these days are thanks Thank you, Dr. Braybrand. Very quickly, I will share some comments and I also have some questions. 
Um, one of the things that I wanted to share, I think this came up earlier, is this feasible in a school setting. Uh, I had the privilege of serving as a school principal for over 15 years, and this has always been an issue. But in the jurisdiction that I worked in, in recent years, this was an approach that was taken to offer a calendar that just didn't highlight the holidays, but it demanded that school principals responded to it, as well as PTAs. This was, and these were blackout days, do nothing, including um, opportunities to observe what may be taking place at sundown the days, the days before certain holidays. And it was productive, it, it was effective. It was something that we used to help establish the school's calendar right there. It was the first, uh, it was the first thing that was reviewed when you're building your school events. And, and so I see opportunity for this to be real growth since this is a new um, procedure for Fairfax County. But as I think was shared earlier, this also has to be levied with an opportunity for accountability and reporting if it is not working well particularly reporting that does not expose or jeopardize anyone's personal sense of safety. So it may be an opportunity for some anonymous reporting, but I, I leave it all to you to include the feedback that you've received tonight so that no one feels jeopardized and saying, hey, I was not heard. Chairman um, Anderson, one thing I would just say there that I, I think we can work on is following up with the chiefs on the role of the ombudsman in all of this for both staff and families around these specific issues of the O's, so thank you. I think that's a wonderful approach, Dr. Braybrand, thank you. Um, a couple of questions that I have. On the calendar that was provided, how many days were highlighted by the STAR? Because I don't think I counted, probably should have done that. There are 15 uh, our, our O days. 15. For me, again, this is progress because we have talked about the plurality and the diversity that exists in Fairfax County. Expanding the opportunity for 15 different, uh, dif different faiths to have the opportunity to observe without penalty, I, I think it's great progress. Um, it is certainly more than the four that were being discussed um, earlier with previous calendars. Another question that I have, uh, Mr. Smith, is when we're talking about closer, um, school closings, can you speak to what is the impact of that on hourly employees? On, on school closings, so uh, the question earlier had been about the, uh, our food nutrition service workers and our bus drivers. In calendars A and B, there were only 178 student days and so they were losing days where they would normally be working and providing service for students in the system. And so they were concerned about losing those uh, paid non-work days or losing those paid work days. We regularly balance out the schedule with paid non-work days for those employees. With version D, it aligns to our current calendar so there are no additional non-work days built in and there are no additional non-paid days worked in, uh, built in. How many, with this calendar that is being proposed, or even this year's calendar, how many non-paid days are? There are 30 non-paid days, which is what is in our current calendar, with six paid non-work days. I'm sorry, would you please repeat that? There are 30 days where employees would not be paid, and then we build in six paid non-work days for those employees. And thank you. Yes. And I think that's important to um, pay attention to because our system provides not just education for our students and opportunity to shine and to be seen, but it's also a lifeline for our employees. And I know that these are our lowest, er, our lowest earning employees and they could least afford to have additional non-paid days be provided to them. Thank you. Um, I think these are the points that I, oh, I did have one more question and I think uh, Ms. Darna Koufax raised that because if we were to make decisions as a board that prides itself on making data-driven decisions, I would want to have some idea of what would be a reasonable threshold for us to determine that the absenteeism um, rate is significant enough to impact school closure. 
Anybody want to respond to any of it? And we will be looking at that as part of the process. And, and again, given the incon inconclusivity of the data and the uh, time that we were looking at, uh, we just didn't feel that we had the, the time to provide that kind of uh, analysis that was needed. Thank you very much. Seeing that there are no other speakers to this part of the questioning, I will now call on Ms. McLaughlin for the motion. Thank you. I'm just trying to yet again find where we've refreshed and gotten the new motion posted. So I'll just test my eyes right here. <laughs> My dear colleagues, I move that the school board adopt calendar D as recommended by the superintendent for school year 2021-22. Is there a second? Ms. Solon, thank you. Ms. McLaughlin, would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, I'll try to be brief because it's very late in the hour, um, but I do want to cover some important things. Uh, first of all, I appreciate the dialogue that we've had um, this evening and trying to help our community understand how seriously we take this this matter and wanting to continuously improve But I hope that my colleagues will c support calendar D for the following reasons when you look at the importance of due diligence equity and community engagement Calendar D is the appropriate calendar at this time at where we are with our community and with the data to going into the new school year because we do need to have a calendar and our families and our schools need to plan. In terms of due diligence, we know in speaking with um, legal guidance um, that uh, it is important that we cannot show favoritism over any religion towards others. Uh, we know that when we pull the student absentee data uh, for the 15 uh, holidays that are uh, now going to be on calendar D is religious observances. Uh, that among those 15, uh, there is a wide range of impact. But overall, what we are seeing is that um, in Fairfax County, on any given day, you can have three and a half to five and a half students out who are absent. For the religious holidays that were recommended in, the, in calendars A and B, we had a variation that could be anywhere from as low as a 1% differential. Some there was a net neutral differential, uh, but only as high as an additional maybe 5% more of the students. So what we're looking at is about on any given day, even with religious observances, 90% of our students are still coming to school. I recognize that we need to have a better culture so that students are able to choose to observe. And I think we may see coming into the next year, very robust data that will help us better understand among these 15 holidays, will we see um, significant absenteeism and have that further deliberation. In terms of the equity at, um, aspects of it, again, when we did not have the religious task force looking at the data of the absenteeism among all of these religious holidays, they did not have this information in front of them, and that is regrettable. Uh, but what we are seeing is that there is uh, it, very um, similar absenteeism among those. And so I don't know how you can single out four among those 15. I also note that we have got to understand and engage with our families about the impact that closing for religious holidays and its impact on our working families and childcare needs. Our free and reduced lunch population, where 30% or more of our students rely on the food each day, special education and ELL students who are impacted by school closures. And finally, with continuous improvement, uh, we have got to engage our full community. We haven't had this conversation with them and if we're going to change our calendar and do something new, then we've got to have that, that greater county-wide engagement conversation. And I'm sorry I ran out of time, so maybe I'll get a go back. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Ms. Tolan, you want to speak to your second? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm seconding this motion for a variety of reasons. Um, I do have some mixed feelings. Um, I grew up in a Christian household, um, so can never really fully understand the pain of not having my religious holidays recognized. 
However, I also grew up in a household that promoted tolerance and acceptance and exploration of all people and cultures. So it is impossible for me to accept that we as a district cannot find ways to celebrate and understand the breadth of the diversity among our families and staff. It is hard for me to not think we can develop a calendar process that will respect everyone. I want to thank members of our community that spent time with me over the past weeks to discuss this issue and to help me see the hard work that we need to do around religious and cultural celebrations. The work that needs to be done is not only about the calendar vote tonight. This work is about overall policies, regulations, and approaches to having all of our students and staff feel welcome and appreciated. Our board is here to do this longer term hard work and I look forward to these collaborations. Thank you to Ro Temple Road of Shalom, the McLean Islamic Center, the Adams Center, the Jewish Community Relations Council, and the Chinese American Parent Association and others for your time and thoughtfulness in your real life stories. I support this motion because Calendar D is an option that can be an interim calendar for us next year. It maximizes in-school time as we come out of the pandemic. It maximizes continuity of pay for our hourly staff, helps working families keep a predictable schedule, and allows us to look at holidays across many religions and cultures for potential future inclusion in our calendars. Adding flex days with careful directions as to what can and cannot happen on those and surrounding days can allow us to experiment with this idea of recognizing a large number of special days to really acknowledge the breadth of our diversity. Regulations around these days can release the stress people feel to make a choice not to be in school. The data we do have shows us that there are many special days for our families that need to be acknowledged. Some of those days were surprises, such as Orthodox Christmas. We need to take time to get accurate data and do the proper analysis. This calendar is not perfect. It will place burdens on our staff that live outside of Fairfax County, and we will need to see how that affects our operations. I can support this motion because it is being followed by other motions tonight that set the course for the work that needs to be done around subsequent calendars and our real work for religious and cultural equity and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Tolan. Ms. Cohen? I'll confess that I began these conversations around the proposed calendars in a different mindset. I began to hear the stories in my community from students, staff, and their families of the pain that they've incurred in trying to observe the holidays that their faith commands that they observe. I've heard stories of loss, of punishment, of anti-Muslim and anti-Semitic words and actions. The overarching effect of our actions in FCPS tell our kids and staff that observing their religion is a problem, that as a system we are unable to accommodate a day or two in the entire year for them to observe without feeling punished. Without intention, we have sent the message to our students that being a student here and observing your religion are incompatible, that there is a cost. And not surprisingly, with that understanding, our students go against their religion and choose to sit in classrooms rather than do what their religion commands of them. What a choice for a kid. Every time in my own family, when my children faced consequences for being Jewish, I told them to look the other way. Try to get along, I said. Don't make a fuss, I said. Just try to be the same as everyone else, I said. But what I was really saying was swallow who you are. Because being different is a problem here. I regret that more than I can say. The message to my children was that your religion is not worth standing up for. And I cannot fix that now. But it can be a part of helping our students and staff Stop swallowing who they are. So though I've spent my life trying to get along to get along, I will not vote for this calendar tonight. 
I won't vote for it because the Springfield District agrees that we should find a way to include these holidays. And I won't vote for it because my kids, all our kids, deserve to know that they matter for all the things that make them uniquely them. And that adults should never ask them to make the choices that we ask them to make because it is our job to teach them to never swallow who they are. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Mr. Frisch. Thank you. Um, as I said when we began the calendar conversation, I feel the need to acknowledge my privilege here. While I'm not religious, uh, growing up, my family celebrated Christian holidays like Christmas. It's not lost on me that as we talk about the value of pluralism and the secular nature of our school system, that the traditions of my upbringing have never been on the chopping block when we're considering the calendar, not even considered. <clears throat> I believe that we must demonstrate our commitment to equity in the spirit of one Fairfax by joining neighboring school systems where nearly one out of three FCPS staff members live by closing school on widely observed holidays, including Diwali, Eid, Yom Kippur, and Good Friday. These closures would acknowledge the rich diversity of Fairfax County and reduce conflict and confusion around religious accommodations for students and staff. They would also mitigate operational struggles for staff who live in neighboring counties and whose children attend schools that are closed on these days. Tonight, there will be a series of motions and votes on various aspects of the calendar. Rather than speaking on each of these motions and to save us all some time, I would like to be clear where I stand. While I know it is likely to be approved tonight, I will not be supporting calendar D. Additionally, though it is not likely to pass tonight, I will support an amendment to calendar D that would close school on the previously mentioned days. It is my hope that when the board requested a fourth calendar option that the superintendent and his team would return with a compromise that recognized a few of the days and that they would develop a way to make sure our support staff did not experience financial hardships as a result of the changes. If there was sufficient support on this board to close school on these days, I would also support efforts to recognize Lunar New Year in Rosh Hashanah. Finally, I enthusiastically support tonight's follow-on motion, which directs the superintendent to have the chief academic officer, chief operations officer, and chief equity officer lead work to establish a calendar development process that clarifies, clarifies the criteria and priorities used to establish annual calendars in the future, including recognition of religious and cultural observances. Further, I support efforts to make that go into effect in time to impact the following year's calendar. The calendar process should bring people together. It has done the opposite these past few weeks. The board can chart a different path in the future if only it seizes the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. <clears throat> Ms. Marin. <clears throat> Uh, good evening. Um, I will not be supporting this motion to support the proposed calendar. I remain perplexed that a seeming majority of my colleagues disagree about the need to adjust the calendar to include holidays that have been in consideration for inclusion for over a year and advocacy for which has occurred for years, if not decades. Um, you know, I understand the calendar needs to prioritize academics. And when I served on the calendar committee last year uh, in 2020, it was an exercise in mental gymnastics. We were all raising priorities and trying to rank them and prioritize them and get creative. If we center the students, students have spoken to how it is a hindrance to their well-being. As a member of minority faith, I understand what that feels like. I, I think this process has produced some good. Um, I've been heartened to see how some of my board member colleagues have change their thinking by being informed by advocacy. And I think that's really powerful. And I know that all of my colleagues are committed to equity. So I do think that in the future, we will get somewhere much better, but it, it does tremendously hurt my heart that a lot of hurt has been kicked up this month at a time when no one needed extra angst. Um, I will follow Mr. Frisch's example of stating where I am on the other um, follow on motions and amendments. I um, do support the uh, calendar amendment that will come forth trying to add Yom Kippur, Diwali, Eid, and Good Friday to the calendar. Uh, and then I am going to propose a motion to solidify that the superintendent will take action with the chief academic officer, equity officer, and um, who am I missing, operations officer, to produce a much uh, 
a, a stronger calendar. You, you know, I, I do want to say that when the calendar committee first started, a group of FCPS staff had worked. It was like a special task force of professionals that really tried to weigh all the options. So, you know, this whole process has been very informed, but the angles have changed, life has changed. Um, the, you know, time was the enemy of this. And so I do have hope that something better will come, that we can be creative. And um, I hope that, um, that we will just continue working for something that we know that our students deserve. Thank you. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Marin. Ms. Um, Sizemore Heiser. Thank you. Um, like Ms. Cohen, I have come probably 180 degrees on this from when I started in February. And that is because when I was in February, um, I viewed this from an equality lens and a lens that came from my training as a lawyer. In the meantime, I met with many stakeholders, heard the experiences of families, deployed a form that got over 670 responses, and really reflected on what my experience was being raised as a Hindu while attending public schools in California, which was very uncomfortable for the sheer amount of times I was othered in so many ways, unintentional or intentional, big and small. This has led me to view this with an equity lens at the center of my thinking, not an equality lens. It's led me to think about how we can be inclusive, about how we can start somewhere to stop perpetuating the dominance in action and understanding. So long as we have a calendar, such as Calendar D, that has two weeks off for Christmas, for a Christian holiday, but not others, we have chosen. People keep saying, how can we choose? Well, we are. We have. We continue to choose. We continue to choose to perpetuate the dominance of the majority at the detriment of the minority. In fact, our society has chosen for decades, from school prayer to Christian holidays being celebrated in school, and now a school calendar built around Christian holidays. To be clear, I am not advocating to have school on Christmas. Rather, I am saying we should be more inclusive than just have two weeks off around Christmas. And sure, there are legal reasons we can do this. After all, federal law makes it a federal holiday, just as previous laws perpetuated the dominance of the majority. It's time to stop perpetuating this cycle. The real question should be not how do we choose, but are we being equitable in doing this? Are we being equitable in saying how can we choose when we are choosing? Calendar D is othering. We are asking those of minority faiths to choose to other themselves, to separate themselves from the majority, to segregate themselves by missing school while everyone else continues together to learn, engage, and as Nathan said, hang out and be part of the community. We are asking our staff to segregate themselves by taking personal days off without, with the right to make them up. But for Christmas, nobody is othered. No one has to make it up. We are all the same. You heard it in the video from Sarah, the student, the student who spoke, about feeling othered, about having to choose. There is a trauma that comes from being othered. I know, I have lived it since I was five years old. We talk about centering equity. We talk about intentionally disrupting the dominance. In fact, that is the concept around being anti-racist. Being anti-racist says it's not enough to be not racist. Being anti-racist says we need to deliberately disrupt the systems of inequities that have been built over the years, just like the system of inequity that calls Christmas a secular holiday and makes it a federal holiday. Doesn't that apply here? Shouldn't we disrupt this system of inequity, of dominance over one, of one religion that has been perpetuated by many years and still is perpetuated by federal law? Isn't this especially important given the rising incidence of hate and rhetoric over the last few years? Or do we want to perpetuate a calendar that is the calendar of separate but equal? Because we all know that is inherently unequal. So do you want to know how we choose? I'll tell you after my motion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Eismaheiser. Ms. Omesh. Thank you. When we started off this process, uh, you know, we ha were faced with various options, and the community was informed, 
of two options that they celebrated over months. We're looking forward. The, the localities around us uh, all decided to do the same in, in leading on the fronts that many of my colleagues already spoke to. Uh, and after much difficulty, I put forward a motion with clear intentions to bring forward a compromise, an option that would bring people together and allow us to lead by saying, you know what? We don't have to pit support staff against religious minorities. And you know what else? We won't forget the fact that there are actually support staff who are also religious minorities. And that we don't have to make these separate interests and that it's not a zero-sum game as we continue to think about. We received an option that, to me, I don't see how we factored in academic success because you know what? There are thousands of students out there whose academic success wasn't prioritized. And socio-emotional well-being and the absenteeism data that we saw. Because I don't understand how we can't justify a holiday when 11% of our entire student population is absent compared to other ones that we take off that have less. Or, or worse, when we decide that we want to do something, like last year, the day before last minute, we take off Juneteenth, which is a welcome holiday. But when we want to do it, we do it. And that's one of the things I want us to notice in our, in, in our behaviors and what's happening in our decision making here. The, the, the banner of our country was never freedom from religion. It was freedom of religion. When we talk about equity, you know, Dr. Williams framed this for us from the get-go. We had a choice. Exclusion, assimilation, or pluralism. And clearly the choice forward should have been pluralism. We want to say, rather than leave your religion at home, keep it to yourself, don't be who you are, no, bring who you are. Let's learn from one another, let's come together, and let's be inclusive of everybody. We took steps and we said that we've accomplished something. But we know that largely what we did is the same as what we've been doing. So I don't want to convey the wrong message to folks today. And in addition, we said, if we can't do it for every little thing, then we can't do it for anyone. When we th think about equity, we need to be thinking about equity versus equality. That's the whole premise of why we do this work. It's not always the same. And we saw the data. We asked for the data and we saw it. We came up with legal reasons and we addressed them. We found ways to compromise and to bring solutions, but that wasn't good enough. Our students spoke loud and clear. This is one of the most consistent community responses we have heard in a long time, especially on an equity issue. We have not heard significant voices at all talking about why we shouldn't be inclusive. All we heard was requests for solutions, and we presented them and they weren't voted on. And that's incredibly disappointing. It's, it's unfortunate. Uh, and I don't understand how we expect our system to see our kids when after the data conversation we were just having, we're not even willing to track Thank these you, things Ms. that Omesh. matter. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. Ms. Corbett Sanders. I'm a little confused because I thought there was going to be a follow-on motion that we were going to speak to first, or not a follow-on, but an amendment. But since people are speaking to this uh, matter, I do want to do some, uh, ask some questions because I'm a little confused as to what the legality is in how um, we can choose to take religious holidays off. Because I was under the impression that we, and we received a legal briefing, not only from uh, you, Mr. Foster, but also from an outside group that referenced a legal case that said how you could um, make decisions on, le on uh, religious holidays. Could you give us a briefing on that? Because we are a public school system that does have to adhere to the law. Uh, right, uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Um, you know, I, uh, I I don't want to get into too much detail given the attorney-client privilege nature of the uh, of the guidance I've provided. But um, in summary, I can say that um, the uh, as a public entity, um, this school board, like any school board, um, can grant religious holidays, but there needs to be a secular purpose for uh, doing so, and. 
Um, we'd received a memo from um, the uh, AJC that uh, also provided some case law. I mean, the bottom line is in the Zorak case, um, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, did um, uh, approve or uphold a release day uh, approach uh, that was used in that case. And calendar D is, um, you know, I think very uh, closely analogous to that. And so the, uh, the case law cited by AGC, um, I think, supports Calendar D. Um, my previous analysis concluded that Calendar D was legally compliant because schools will remain open, uh, but those students who choose to take a particular religious day off so that they can um, observe that and exercise their religion will be able to do so. Okay, thank you. So I would like to um, just speak to a couple of things. One. I agree with you, Ms. Seismer-Heiser, that two weeks at the winter break is excessive and that if we are looking to do something that we should consider utilizing some of those days to, uh, to provide opportunities for, um, for holidays based on legally permissive uh, thresholds. And I would be fully supportive of in the next year doing just that is unpacking that data. But I am s concerned about how we got here and what a absolute mess it has been because of the intent of the previous board to actually have p policy proposals brought to us from a task force that would be representative of the community of Fairfax County. And that task force was to be representative of all the faiths in Fairfax County. And what happened was a task force was established and it wasn't fully representative. And that task force recommendation stopped at a calendar versus not looking at just a calendar, but we had asked them to look at all policies to see how we could be a much more welcoming and inclusive school system. So the recommendations went not back to the school board, but they came, they went directly to the calendar committee. And there was a miscommunication of some sort where there was some sort of agreement that everybody supported this without having it even being gone through any sort of vetting process. And that there, there were expectations set in the community which really is quite unfortunate because of how it was done. So what happens with calendar D in my mind is that it is one that meets all of the criteria that was laid out by this board just a couple of weeks ago. But it also clearly states that it's an interim calendar and one that is necessary so that we can actually go back and do the very intentful work that is necessary to identify and support all of the communities <coughs> that are represented in uh, Fairfax County and not just a subset. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Darnot Koufax. Yes, thank you. So um, I'm, I will speak to the motion on the table. Um, I do want to thank everyone who's reached out to me on this topic. Um, but I do want to share something about my family. And then I will tell you why I'm going to, I am supporting Calendar D. But my family is made up of two religious minorities. My husband is Jewish and I am Orthodox Christian. Our family celebrates many of the holidays from both sides of our faiths, as well as some of the majority Christian holidays. But through the years, my kids have, try, have to try out for sports and audition for plays, choirs, and musicals on some of our holidays. My daughter has experienced anti-Semitic comments while I served on this board, where I as a parent had to go in and talk to administration about the comments being hurled at her and others in her high school. The administration dealt with it effectively. I share this with you to tell you my family has experienced the issues the constituents have brought before us. As a society, we are deal with, dealing with what, something that is complicated, oftentimes devices and emotional faith. And we deal with this every day. The calendar is but one way to begin these difficult conversations 
to talk about equity, to lean in. How can our public schools, how can they and how should they recognize this complex issue of faith in our diverse community? Unfortunately, this process that brought us to this place was flawed. And I'm sorry if this process has caused hurt. I know it has caused hurt in me and it stirred many emotions. Fairfax is a rich and beautiful and diverse community. We've found out that our students speak over 194 language and represent 200 birth countries. But as I asked Dr. Braybrand just moments ago, how do we choose from such rich diversity what to acknowledge? When do we start the year? How do we end the year? What are the measurements? Is year-round school an option that the majority of the community wants to explore? And this is going to require much deeper and broader conversation where everyone must sit at the table. Yes, yesterday I spoke to someone who worked at a college, said they spent over four years to get their calendar right, and it's still a work in progress. And while calendar D is imperfect, it is a start with a regulation rather than guidance, acknowledgement of 15 religious and cultural observances where there have been higher than average absences, and the door needs to stay open for courageous conversation where everyone must come together and we have to continue to work to find the best solution to celebrate the diverse faiths of our diverse community. So I will be supporting Dee. Thank you, Ms. Donna Koufax. Ms. Pekarski. Great, thank you. I'll also be supporting um, D, and I want to make just a few comments. I think this has been an unnecessarily long and inadvertently painful process, but I want to thank many in the public that have reached out. They've shared their feelings, their experiences with me, um, and I know tonight there will be disappointments for some valued members of our community, as well as for some of my own colleagues. What I gain from my conversations with religious leaders is that we still have work to do to educate our staff and students that we must respect each other's diverse backgrounds and religions. The school board has been tasked with making data-driven decisions while respecting and celebrating our extremely diverse student body. Above all, however, I heard a desire for recognition and affirmation, and that conversation does not end today, nor is there a calendar alone that remedies those feelings. I do believe that the new calendar option gives religious and cultural observances stronger protections by noting them on the calendar and enhancing our regulations. There are 50 noted observances. I have not heard from advocates or my colleagues how we prioritize these. That is fact. That's the reality of the hard decisions we make. In fact, I heard that my own minority faith did not even make the list until I self-advocated to be acknowledged. Lunar New Year and observance extremely important to many of my constituents in the Sully District, forgotten because they did not even make it to the decision-making table. As a school board member, I'm committed to ensuring every student in Fairfax County receives the best possible education. As I analyzed the calendars, my priority was to maximize the number of instructional days and continuity of learning, which equates to five days a week in a classroom. The first two options, A and B, recommended by the calendar committee, fell well short of these priorities. Both had complete five-day school weeks, less than 50% of the school year, 50%, and it cut the 180 instructional days. For a public school system committed to free access of education and recovery from COVID, that is just unacceptable to me. These options also penalize our support staff, which are a very diverse group of committed employees. I believe that where we are today with the time constraints, the flawed process, and the lack of engagement of our families to set priorities for what they expect from a school calendar, Calendar D is our only option tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Pekarski. Seeing that there are no other speakers, I will briefly take a turn, especially given the hour, I wanna be mindful um, I will be also supporting Calendar D for many of the reasons that were stated, but I just want to reiterate what I shared at the very beginning of this process, which was, I believe, February 2nd. I believe we need the benefit of time to have a process that is more holistic and more representative of the entirety of Fairfax County. We did not have this at this point. We do need to be sure that we have the opportunity to review any of our decisions 
to determine what the impact is on all of our employees, including the hourly and support staff that Ms. Bukarski just um, referred to. We need the benefit of time to do something that is comprehensive and appropriate. And I think this COVID calendar, which is what I called it since February, we need to have that as our gap calendar until we can fully embrace all of the information and all of the um, new ideas that were shared tonight. I'm encouraged by some of the recommendations that have been made by staff regarding moving forward in terms of how we are going to hold schools accountable to ensure that students do not feel as if they have to choose. But we can allow all of our students to elect to celebrate in the ways that they need to without penalty. Um, having said that, those are the rest of my comments. I do realize that there are uh, some, oof, computer died here, that there are some additional motions to be made. And at this time, I would like to call on Ms. Sizemore Heiser for an amendment. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. I move to amend the main motion by adding school holidays on the following days. Yom Kippur, Diwali, Eid al fitr and Good Friday and direct the superintendent to adjust the calendar accordingly to maintain 180 instructional days. Sarah, second. Second. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Anderson, I do have a point of order about the amendment before we go on. Please go ahead. Uh, the way I'm reading this and understanding it, this in essence nullifies the main motion, which sets us back to square one we are going to be voting on something that we haven't seen. Um, I just don't understand how this is an amendment, so I'd like that to be explained. Okay. Um, I think we may need some support here from our parliamentarian because an amendment would make an adjustment to an existing motion, but I understand your statement was, is that if we vote on this, then it will be for a calendar that is unseen. Correct. We will be voting to ask the superintendent to go back and fix a calendar that none of us have seen but are now adopting. I, I, this doesn't seem like the appropriate way to get to what I think our colleagues are trying to get to. Um, Mr. Morgan, would you please um, provide us with some support as to whether or not this meets threshold for an amendment? Uh, the decision, of course, uh, does belong to the chair, but it is the opinion of the parliamentarian that the chair can reasonably rule the motion to amend as worded is out of order because if the motion to amend and the main motion both pass, then it may be unclear what the board has agreed to. That is, the board would both be adopting the calendar before it and directing the superintendent to make additional unspecified changes to the calendar to adjust the calendar to maintain 180 instructional days. Robert's Rules of Order in the Revised 12th Edition, Section 10.9, notes that a motion should be worded in a concise, unambiguous, and complete form appropriate to becoming the officially recorded statement of an action taken by the Assembly. As such, the Chair can reasonably rule that a motion to amend is out of order if it is the opinion of the Chair that the amendment would modify the main motion to simultaneously and ambiguously include both adopting the calendar being considered and holding that the calendar being adopted is actually a version of the proposed calendar that will somehow be modified by future changes yet to be determined. Okay, that was certainly a lot, but I think I understand the gist of the, um, what I need to rule on is the fact that this may be considered ambiguous and may essentially cancel the initial motion, not just amend it. Um, in that case, I will rule that to be out of order. Are there, a, Okay. So that motion is out of order. Uh, Mr. Morgan, I do have an additional question. What is the recourse for our colleagues who want to provide some additional guidance to the superintendent regarding these four holidays, since we're not able to... Point of order, Dr. Anderson. Just one more okay. second. Um, Mr. Morgan, what is the... Um, the request for our colleagues in order to follow up since I have ruled this out of order. If the calendar before the board does not have the support of its members, then the board can decline to adopt the calendar and instruct the superintendent to return with another option to consider. Or the board can make all of the changes needed to make the calendar acceptable to a majority of the board. 
that would mean making the adjustments as part of the amendment. Uh, the board could adopt the calendar before it and at a future meeting adopt amendments to the calendar. Uh, or the board could adopt the calendar before it, authorize the superintendent to modify the calendar within parameters and during such time frame as the board may prescribe and recommend the superintendent make particular modifications. Uh, any of those options would avoid the ambiguity of the, the amendment that uh, was proposed. Mr. Morgan, I hate to ask you this again. Could you please repeat the last um, three options that you shared that, that uh, is yes. a possible opportunity for moving forward? The last three options? Yes. yes. You, you, uh, yep. Your last three statements in terms of what is possible. May I ask if possible. he speaks up? I can't hear him well. May I ask him to speak up? I cannot hear him well. Absolutely. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay, I'll just speak a little closer you, to the microphone. One second, Mr. Morgan. Did you hear any of what he had stated? Or should he repeat I just, the entire know. last comment? The last three or four yeah. options, I think I didn't. Mr. Mr. Morgan, can you just repeat the last comment that, I, uh, that you stated in response to my question regarding what is a pathway for our colleagues who want to offer some sort of amendment on, as we've discussed? Yes, Madam Chair. If the calendar before the board does not have the support of its members, then the board can decline to adopt the calendar and instruct the superintendent to return with another option, and option E, to consider, or the, option, or the board can make the changes needed to make the calendar acceptable to a majority of the board. So that would mean not just adding holidays, but also making whatever changes are actually needed to maintain that 180 instructional days. Uh, the board could adopt the calendar before it and at a future meeting adopt amendments to the calendar or the board could adopt the calendar before it but authorize the superintendent to modify the calendar within parameters and during such time frame as the board may prescribe and recommend but in this case not require that the superintendent make particular modifications those are all options that would avoid ambiguity thank you and all of these uh, options are pending the failure of the main motion uh no one okay. of uh, two of those options would actually be doable if the main motion it, as as it currently stands is adopted okay thank you so much for that clarification point uh, of Sizemore, clarification point of clarification um mr, mr. Morgan, Frisch, go ahead mr morgan um, could Ms. Sizemore Heiser offer, since her amendment has been ruled out of order, could she not reoffer the same amendment um, with a slight change to the second sentence um, that clarifies mm -hmm. when the 180 days would be reached? That's what I was going to ask, Mr. Frisch, in my point Sorry. of order. <laughs> I was just about to call on her next. Um, yeah. Should I, Mr. Frisch? I'm going to go ahead and defer to Ms. Um, Sizemore-Heiser. I think you have the same points. Ms. So, Sizemore-Heiser and then Ms. McLaughlin. Yes, that was my question is can I then, since you ruled it out of order, can I, for the fourth part of what Mr. Morgan said, which I, I still had trouble hearing exactly what he said, which was authorize the superintendent to modify the calendar and make recommendations, which seems fairly close to what I just did here. So I'm very confused on number four is different than this actual motion, which is authorizing these holidays and directing him to adjust the calendar accordingly. I could change it to recommend that he adjust the calendar accordingly. Is that the only difference, Mr. Morgan? Because otherwise I really don't understand the difference between your option, your last option presented number four and what's presented here as the motion. Mr. Morgan? That last option, the difference between them it was um, in making a direction to adjust the calendar without specifying how it has to be modified to be acceptable to the board uh, versus just authorizing the superintendent to make changes without requiring any particular change. So if I change the language to authorize the superintendent to adjust the calendar accordingly to maintain 180 instructional days, would that be sufficient for number four? Mr. Morgan? Uh, that would be a decision of the chair to make. Can you please it does seem, go ahead? Uh, it, it does seem like that may be
be acceptable. Uh, the only question that the members might make is, is the, is the calendar with the four holidays added and without a requirement to make other adjustments, does that still meet whatever statutory requirements are met? And that's out of the, uh, beyond the scope of what I can. That's part of the vote. That's mm -hmm. not part of the parliamentarian part. Ms. Sizemore has it. Can you repeat what your new language is, please? Sure. It would be, I move to amend the main motion by adding school holidays on the following days. Yom Kippur, Diwali, Eid al-Fitr, and Good Friday, and, direct, and authorize excuse me, the superintendent to adjust the calendar accordingly to maintain 180 instructional days. Okay, because that authority, as I believe I understand it now, and please let me know, Mr. Morgan, if I am not accurate on this, is that the authority provides now um, clear, um, I, I guess it, it provides the superintendent with the authority to go ahead and make these changes without it needing to come back to the board. We're essentially giving away that authority for um, an, an additional approval. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I will accept your change at this point, and let's be sure that the language reflects that, and I want to be sure that everyone is clear on what I've just shared with, um, and that Mr. Morgan also confirmed. We have a few more speakers on this amendment, which has now been, this amendment has been made. It needs to be seconded, seconded by Ms. Cohen. We'll have speakers to that, and we will start with Ms. McLaughlin. Don't I speak to my motion? Oh, I'm so sorry. It's, we did not, we skipped that part. Um, please speak to your motion. All right, give me one second. Um, so, many have asked, how do we choose these holidays? There was a question raised today regarding what is the legal requirements of Mr. Foster. So I will posit that how do we choose between the, all the, all the cultural observances that Ms. Um, Pekarski mentioned is the wrong question. I posit that since we're already choosing Christmas, the question should be, do we only choose Christmas or do we find a way to be more inclusive? Mr. Foster mentioned we have to have a secular reason for picking, these, for picking holidays, and I understand that as a lawyer. So here's my answer as to the secular reason for picking these four holidays and how we choose. My understanding is that Loudoun County Public Schools, Arlington County Public Schools, and Prince William County Public Schools are all giving days off on Yom Kippur, Eid al-Fitr, Diwali, and Good Friday. It is also my understanding that 30 to 40% of our employees live outside Fort Fairfax County. So I might argue that these specific four days where three of our surrounding jurisdictions do not have school, but we do, with so many of our staff living in those districts, can cause operational challenges for FCPS on those four days, Yom Kippur, Eid al-Fitr, Diwali, and Good Friday. And this, I believe, from my reading of the case law, is a long-standing secular reason, absenteeism or operational challenges. After all, absenteeism is only one secular reason. And operational challenges, from my understanding, can be perceived so, for Fairfax County Public Schools to have schools in person on Yom Kippur, Eid al-Fitr, Diwali, and Good Friday can be seen as a clear perceived operational challenges given the sheer number of our staff that live in our surrounding jurisdictions. That is how we pick. That is how we create a calendar that is more inclusive than just Christmas. That is how we move forward in a way that better centers equity than calendar D. Is it perfect? No. But neither is calendar D. Are we picking? Yes. So is calendar D. At least it's picking in a way that's more inclusive. And with 180 days instruction, it is the same number of paid days for our support staff as calendar D, which doesn't penalize them in a way that calendars A and B did and I will hope that our superintendent can be mindful of consistency as he adjusts the calendar. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cohen, would you please speak to your second? Yes, ma'am. I know in this amendment, these dates off are not all that our community was hopeful we might include, but I'm asking my colleagues to consider adding these dates as the beginning of a renewed commitment to a more equitable and inclusive calendar. 
These additional holidays mirror the calendars of a majority of our surrounding counties in which more than 30% of our employees live. I'm hopeful that the addition of these days off will help to mitigate the operational impact of trying to find substitutes for all of our employees who have students in those neighboring school systems. By not mirroring those counties, we are asking our employees with families to take on an additional four to five days of childcare or personal leave in addition to the five days of spring break, which is now misaligned with many of our neighboring counties as well. If we do not incorporate these days as holidays, I hope my colleagues will be supportive of extending additional paid personal leave to our employees to negate the impacts of this misalignment. I'm hopeful on a night where we passed an equity and education resolution that we make that commitment to our students who practice minority religions as well. Thank you. Other speakers to this motion? Ms. Omesh? Thank you. You know, one of the most beautiful things that actually came out of all of this was how community leaders came together and how community members actually came forward with recommendations. Obviously, this isn't perfect. There is no uh, way to say that, you know, we, we wanted to uh, or we we're going to leave out certain groups or that we're not including X, Y, Z. Uh, the ideal situation would really be inclusive towards everyone. But this allows us to be able to say to our, ch to our children, to our students that, you know what, we're taking this day off because your friend, the kid who sits next to you, your neighbor, has this observance. And we're a county where we believe in observing these things because we're, we're, we're inclusive, we're pluralistic, we're a society that understands the foundations of this country. Uh, and, and, and that's really something to keep in mind. And, and of course, given the, the challenges that have happened, you know, we've asked for the data, we've seen the data. At the end of the day, when we fail with process as a board, we can't choose to put the burden on the community and the burden on those who are most marginalized. This is a place where we can say, you know what, it isn't perfect, but any decision we make has power implications. Any decision we make is marginalizing someone. And so this is an opportunity to say, we're gonna choose the more inclusive, more equitable mistake to make while ensuring that we have a process to make, make amends and do it better the next time. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, does this excuse does it excuse doing nothing, uh, that, that it's not perfect? Of course not, but let's not come up with the excuses. I think this is a welcome opportunity. And to remember that the task force actually had representatives of an interfaith network that represents thousands of congregants from many, many different congregations of varied faiths that are not just Abrahamic, uh, that came together to present this, and that specifically being voice. I mean, Virginia is organized for interfaith community engagement. Uh, so. I don't, I don't want to belabor the point, but I do think that to keep the record straight and to be clear, we even published a legal memo, uh, you know, that, that is posted in board docs, uh, or, you know, I won't call it legal memo, but the, the advisory that we posted talking about how this is, uh, uh, you know, how some of these holidays are in fact, um, you know, uh, uh, stand the test of, of what we're concerned about. So I think this is a welcome step and I look forward to better steps in the future but think this sends the right message. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin, I do apologize. You were next. Uh, please accept my apologies. Please go ahead. No worries. It's now uh, 10 minutes to midnight. Um, I appreciate the um, desire of my colleagues who brought this forward, but I not only can't accept it, I think we are ac absolutely walking into um, legal jeopardy. We have received legal guidance from our attorney we are supposed to be making decisions that will not be viewed in the court of law as arbitrary and capricious it was not not making decisions that are going to look like favoritism of any religion over others and that's exactly what this is the, one of the four holidays diwali our current data five years worth of data and the only thing that we can do right now till we improve our processes going forward finished dead last out of the 15 holidays. Um, we keep citing Arlington, Prince William, and, and Loudoun County Schools. Uh, in listening to my colleagues who've spoken to those board members, they did not do the due diligence. They thought our published draft calendars meant we had done the due diligence and they followed. Whether there's truth to that or not, what I will say is, Anyone following Fairfax County Board, you will see our legal guidance. You will see 
our data about the 15 holidays and what it's shown over the last five years. We've got to be making a data-driven decision on this particular moment in time. We do not have data to support these four dates. I'm not even aware that Good Friday is one of the ones that, that now the others are having, other than I guess if you tie it to their spring breaks. But this idea that we're going to make or select these four and then try to explain to our community about the other 11 or more uh, with holidays that have more people out, this is an arbitrary and capricious proposal. And I'm really disappointed that this came to the board members an hour and a half before we went into closed session. This is why we're sitting here at 10 minutes to midnight. So while everybody is well-intentioned and honestly, the, the passion is there, I, I think we've reached a low point in being a functional, deliberative body right now. We should have followed our legal guidance that we received, our superintendent who's listened to us in multiple work sessions, and to throw in this amendment an hour and a half before we went into closed isn't how we do good work for ourselves and our community. It's creating more confusion. Please do not support it. Thank you. Um, we have other speakers. Ms. Corbett Sanders. I actually just have a question. Um, the state code has language on who has responsibility for adopting the calendar. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders. The state code specifies it's the school board that approves the annual calendar. So if we were to approve a calendar that actually isn't a fixed calendar, but basically says to the superintendent, go figure out how to do that, that means we're, we're not a, actually adopting a calendar. Is that, I, I'm having a hard time with this. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Foster. If, it, if uh, the superintendent were asked to go uh, you know, do further work on the calendar, that calendar would have to come back to the board at some point for final approval under the code. It would. So, so we wouldn't actually be adopting a calendar tonight if we did this? We'd have to get the, the superintendent to come back and give us a calendar which we would then have to adopt according to the state code. The state code 22.1-79.1 says that it's the school board that adopts the calendar. Okay, thank you. Uh, I can't adopt, so I can't vote on something that I don't actually have a calendar to vote on, so thank you. Thank you. Um, seeing that there are no other speakers, I will take a quick turn, and then I believe Ms. Um, Sizemore-Heiser wanted uh, a go back. Um, you actually hit on my first point, which is the calendar belongs to the board, and at this time, it does not seem to be the responsible thing to delegate that authority um, to the superintendent. So that will be one of the reasons why I'm not in support of this amendment. Secondly, one of the things that I've heard quite a bit is that there's, a, there's an undue burden on staff who are parents in other jurisdictions, but are teachers here. I would like to have that data. I want to know how many people we're talking about here. So that's information that I would like to have to help strengthen whether or not this is an appropriate, um, an appropriate recommendation, an appropriate um, idea to, rec to, to consider. My goodness, it's getting late. Um, I also th want us to be thinking about how are we shifting that burden of childcare? Because while we have a percentage of our students, of our teachers who are parents in other jurisdictions. We also have parents here, dual income parents, both working families. And I would like to also have that information in terms of what is that burden for them for childcare. Um, having said that, I will not be in support of this. So at this point, seeing that there are no other, I'm sorry, Ms. Sizemore-Heiser, you wanted to have a go back on this? No, I was just curious. It seems like we authorize the superintendent to do things that are our duty all the time, so I'm kind of surprised that came up here, but it's no big deal. Let's go ahead and okay. vote. I'm not sure that I heard that. It's okay. I'll just okay. skip it. We're good. Okay. At this time, I would like to call for the vote on the amendment. Um, it is posted on the screen. All those in favor? We have Mr. Frisch, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Sizemore-Heiser, Ms. Marin, and Ms. Um, Amesh. That is five. All of those opposed? 
Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Bakarski, Ms. Darna Koufax, Ms. Tolan, Ms. Keys Gamara, and myself. That is seven. The motion fails. We'll be returning to the main motion, which is the adoption of calendar D. All of those in favor? Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Keys Gamara, Ms. Darna Koufax, Ms. Tolan, and myself. That is seven. All of those against? Mr. Frisch, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Seismo Heiser, Ms. Marin, Ms. Omesh. The motion passes. Ms. Marin, did you have an additional motion? Yes, I do. I'll call on you for your motion. Thank you. It's a bit more of a... Well, a follow-on? It's a follow-on motion, yes. Uh, I move to direct the superintendent to direct the chief academic officer, chief operations officer, and chief equity officer to lead work to establish a calendar development process. The outcomes of this work will be one, establishing roles of staff, board, and community members, and ultimately who owns the process. And two, clarity on the criteria and priorities used to establish annual calendars in the future, including recognition days for religious and cultural observances. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, what this seeks to do is to avoid the complexity that we've been facing over the last month and year prior. It seeks to clarify once and for all for the near future um, that what the process is, what everyone's role is, how we are going to center all the different priorities. It includes the flexibility to um, examine and adopt account, uh, options for including, including recognition days for cultural and religious observances. It basically gives a very straight directive that we need this process to be nailed down and clear so we don't ever have something like this happen again. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Would you like to speak to your second? I think Ms. Marin said it very well. Thank you. Any other speakers to this motion? Ms. McLaughlin. Yeah, I have a question for uh, Division Council. Um, uh, Mr. Foster, as you know, for some of us, the concern is given the legal guidance that um, you have shared uh, that with the 15 identified holidays to date, um, that are in calendar D, uh, going forward for recognition days of, of religious and cultural observances, would we need to make clear to um, the board tonight and certainly the community and certainly anybody working on this that uh, we've, we've got to be mindful of not running afoul of the favoritism challenges of you know picking picking dates. And the way you read this, at least, is that clear enough for the superintendent and his team to understand that, that legal, um, the, the legal analysis component to this work would need to be included? Because that's, that's my, my hesitancy here is we just came through a very messy process with the prior religious task force where no legal guidance was given to them, so they made recommendations thinking they were fine, and then the legal guidance came at, the, at the, a much later date, and so here we are. So I just don't want to run in that again. So is that clear here, or do we need to have uh, the makers of the motion um, getting affirmation from the superintendent that certainly he's going to include um, all essential legal guidance related to this future work. Mr. Foster? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, certainly I'm clear as the chief legal officer for the organization and the board as to what is needed going forward. Um, and I, I don't think that it's necessary in light of that to make any change to the, uh, to the motion. So Dr. Brabrand, as you understand this conversation then, going forward if this um, follow-on motion should pass you understand how important it will be that you consult 
uh, legal counsel and provide legal guidance to any and all stakeholders involved in this? Yes. Okay, great. And secondly, um, Dr. Braburn, because it's not stated in the follow-on motion, um, the last time this was done, the religious task force structure, the processes, all of that was not brought to the board for us to say we're all good to go here. So can you at least affirm that in our continuous improvement effort, you will design a plan and bring the draft to the board before we would proceed so we don't find ourselves like we were here tonight? Yes. Wanderful. Okay. I, I want to just also say for the record again, um, as I listen to my other colleagues who will speak in support of this motion or have other concerns, my greatest fear is what we just went through with the religious task force that did not have all of the religions represented. They made a recommendation without data being provided to them about absenteeism and without the legal guidance essential. So now the religious task force thinks that we disregarded their hard work and we did not. They had a recommendation that was <clears throat> deficient of the things I just stated that were essential. And this board had the, the duty and responsibility to do the due diligence of which they didn't have and why I think we arrived at the appropriate calendar for tonight. So uh, I will um, consider this motion after I listen to what my other colleagues have to say. Thank you. Any other speakers to this motion? Ms. Corbett Sanders. I will be supporting this motion and the next follow on motion because it does capture what uh, was laid out as a very sound uh, process by our chief equity officer earlier this evening. And I think it's very important to have encapsulated this into a, um, a formal motion. So um, I thank the maker of the motion um, and I think that this is a um, sound way forward, especially with the clarifications that were offered in response to Ms. McLaughlin's uh, questions. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Yes, um, I will definitely be supporting this motion um, and the subsequent motion. Um, in my earlier comments, um, this is what I was alluding to where I stated that the only way I could um, support even calendar D was knowing that this um, that we would be asking for this work to occur. Um, you know, the actual real hard dive into, you know, what our priorities are and, you know, what we need to do to establish our regulations and our, our um, systems for, for creating the calendar. And as I mentioned earlier, too, it's just one in um, the work that we need to do to, you know, recognize that our a diverse community and the religious and cultural observances that are so important to so many. So I, I thank uh, Ms. Marion for bringing this forward. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. I wasn't going to speak again, but I feel compelled. That's what I thought. <laughs> I feel compelled when we're talking about data. To, to mention that I've spoken to so many parents over the last few weeks who've said that they are forced to make a decision between keeping their children home uh, or sending them to school and that they often choose sending them to school. And so when we're looking at only attendance data, we're missing the mark. We're missing the mark because there are so many families who choose to send them to school that would not like to otherwise. And so as we have this conversation going forward, and as the superintendent convenes this group of people to work on this process, I hope we will find a better way of ascertaining the efficacy of having these days off or, or some days off on the calendar, uh, because the attendance data alone does not paint a picture of what the community wants. And that is one of the reasons why there has been a conversation about the data that we do ask, either that we enter and assist during, uh, when, when people call in, uh, or in other ways. There has to be a way to protect people's privacy um, and their religious data or other data uh, and get important information that can show us what portions of the community would do if given the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Ms. Eismoheiser? I'll be quick. Um, in listening to these conversations, we seem to have 
narrowed or focused on absenteeism. And I want to be very clear that in this process, which I'll be supporting, that um, Mr. Foster gives a clear legal briefing for all of the reasons that have been used, not just absenteeism, because that is just one. And we've kind of seemed to have stripped it down to that. And so I would just ask to make sure, Dr. Brabrand, that Dr. Mr. Foster is involved in this process with a full briefing, not a limited briefing. Thank you. Thank you. Very quickly, before I go to, uh, to a go back for Ms. McLaughlin, I will take my turn. Uh, Ms. Dernot Koufax, why don't you go ahead? Your microphone is not on, Ms. Dernot Koufax. It, it, it is, oh. <laughs> it is. There we go, yay. Um, I, I do want to thank the maker of the motion because, as I said um, when I was talking about uh, Calendar D and its imperfections, that we need to uh, move along this way. So I do appreciate that. Um, I, I, and, and I just want to echo um, what my colleagues have said. We need to make sure what we are doing um, and, and we add I would almost add, I don't know if we need to do that. Um, I don't know, but, um, you know, to direct the chief equity officer chief and, and, um, and our, our, our FCPS count general counsel. I don't know if that needs to be added or if, you know, it's implied enough, Dr. Braybrand, for you to understand. I, because I think that's an important part that needs to be an, an important player, Mr. Foster, or someone from his team. Yes, I, I've several board members, I think, have commented, as, and you have, and I will make sure he's very closely involved. Well, I would ask the maker of the motion then, would you like to add that? I'm not going to make a big deal about it at this late hour, but is that something you feel comfortable adding to the maker of the motion? Ms. Darnot Koufax, the motion has been seconded. It belongs to the body. So feel free to make an amendment, and then perhaps we can say without objection. Okay. <laughs> if it's going to have a big if discussion, I, I will withdraw it. Um, and um, after, after Chief Equity off in between um, an ad and FCPS general counsel, if the people to be involved. Are there any objections? Seeing none, the clerk will please add the general counsel to the language of the motion. Thank you. Thank you. I see no other speakers, so I will now take my turn. I'm glad to support this motion because I think it gives us exactly what we have been discussing, which is a clear process, appropriate representation, and the benefit of time to be comprehensive. And so I'm glad to support it, and I will leave that there at 12.08 a.m. At this point, I will call for the vote on the motion, seeing that there are no other speakers. Oh, Megan, I am so sorry. You are in my, you're in a place where I do not see you very well. I am in the corner, so you it's a little hard. You are in the hard. corner. I so yes. apologize okay. yet again. Please yeah, go ahead. No worries. I know it's late, but I did want to speak to um, an important point that Mr. Frisch and others have made. Without question, the enrollment data we have over the last five years reflects challenges alone because our very families have said that oftentimes they're not observing their religious holidays, they are sending their children to school. And so it's imperfect in that regard. So going into this new calendar year with the new regulations that the superintendent has put in place with what we know will be a very heavy lift on the principals and teachers to be more inclusive and more mindful of these um, observance days, uh, we will need to see, um, will more families and students take advantage of um, observing and how that will affect enrollment data. But Mr. Frisch, to you and anyone else is concerned, I'm, I'm looking at enrollment data because we've got 15 holidays that have been identified. And when we look at the delta of when students are absent on any given day, being about three and a half to five percent of Fairfax County students, and then we look at the differential on these holidays, it's a differential of maybe another one percent of students being out to maybe another additional five percent. But we will need to help 
all stakeholders involved to understand how do we pick among all of these because some of the choices even the religious commit task force recommended were the ones where we saw the least amount of absenteeism and I, I don't discount that it's it's imperfect but we will have to have some rationale for saying which ones get chosen and finally the point about the two-week break at, at winter at winter time I'm, I'm very troubled that there was an emphasis on Christmas all the time and it's about a two-week Christmas break it's not we have two federal holidays we have a Christmas holiday by the federal government that deems it secular and we have New Year's when 86 percent of our employees and 70 percent of families in our surveys are saying we want the two-week break during that time that's what we're honoring and I want to make sure that's understood thank you Ms. McLaughlin at this time I will call for the vote on the motion seeing that there are no other speakers all in favor Ms. McLaughlin Mr. Frisch Ms. Cohen Ms. Sizemore Heiser, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Pokarski, Ms. Marin, Ms. Omej, Ms. Keys Gamara, Ms. Darna Koufax, Ms. Tolan, and myself. That is unanimous. Motion will pass. Ms. Sizemore Heiser, I call on you for another motion. I move to direct the superintendent to complete the calendar development process in time to be utilized to develop the school year 2022 23 calendar. Second, is there a second? second. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Ms. Eismaheiser, please speak to your motion. Just briefly, I think we're all in agreement. As you said, this is a calendar D is a pandemic calendar or COVID calendar, however you put it. And I want to make sure that whatever process that this is doesn't get dragged on, but is done in time that we can utilize it in a year. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Ditto. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick clarification question before I move to the rest of the speakers. Um, Dr. Brabrand, what is the typical calendar development cycle and timetable? Mr. Smith, um, can you help me on that one? I, I'd say we've been, we've been previous to this, we've been almost a year or two years ahead. Um, when, when, Mr. Smith, would we usually have it done for the coming year? No later than. So it, it varies from year to year. We have gone as late as March with the calendar. We've gone as late as June with the calendar. That's not optimal, but we have gone that late. I know that a few years back, we uh, tried to uh, bring recommendations to the board to give families at least a year in advance so that they would know uh, how to plan. Uh, so with that, we would already be developing that 22-23 uh, calendar uh, at this time. So we'll be working as quickly as possible to put a process together so that we can get something back to the board. Why don't I plan to give the board an update on when we think after the three chiefs get to meet what a timeline would be to bring it and I'll put it in a future uh, superintendent matters and update the community and the board. Thank you. Um, other board members wishing to speak? Ms. McLaughlin? I saw you this time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I guess I have a question again. Um, for the superintendent and Mr. Foster, uh, given as Mr. Smith noted that we really do try to provide the calendar, the next year's calendar advance to our families as much as possible. While we'll do a lot of uh, developing a, a more refined process, I am worried um, with this directive of just uh, mindful that we won't have a year's worth of data on attendance on how our, our new regulation has helped and encouraged um, students to take those days of observation. So, uh, Mr. Foster, will we be able to somehow move without that data to, to develop a calendar that wouldn't make it potentially arbitrary and capricious if we're picking certain holidays versus others? Or how might we then get a calendar ready in time when we won't have gone through a full year calendar to see what happens on which religious holidays have higher absenteeism than others? Mr. Foster. Um, it's, you know, it, it's right that um, having one year um, is not as much data as you would have if you did waited two or three years, but it's been discussed uh, earlier um, this evening 
absenteeism is one data point. There are other data points that we will be looking at um, uh, in advising the uh, superintendent and his team and the board. And so, um, you know, I'll, I think that um, we will be able to provide legal advice to the board um, under this direction, um, given that we're going to be looking at other data points besides absenteeism. Uh, I know it's very late, Mr. Foster, but I guess my question would be to the specificity of considering the, the way that this reads of, of putting some religious observations as holidays closing our school, if we're not using enrollment data, what data would, in a, would we at least be able to defend ourselves if our diverse community comes forward and says, well, why did you pick those four and not any of the other 11? And, and so we're going to have people saying, we well, picked them and not us. That's, that's what I'm trying to understand if we don't have, because we won't even have a year's worth of data based on what Superintendent Braybrand and Mr. Smith said, where we, he would have to be developing this in a way that we might only have half of a school year's worth of, of holidays under the new regulation. So will we just default to the prior five years? Because we won't even have a full year of new data. And so if it's not student enrollment data, what do we demonstrate so that um, we don't put ourselves in legal, legal jeopardy on selecting among those 15? Yeah, it, you know, it's, um, I don't like to speculate in uh, my legal line of work. I can just tell you that um, there are, you know, typically are other data points that we would want to look at, um, and we would bring that, working with the superintendent and his team, to, to the board uh, as part of the decision-making process. I, mean, I don't know what more I can say on that. I appreciate the, that. It's, the, it's, the, it's, the one thing, it's late, but I will say it this way. We can decide. You want all the days, we'll wait till after May 3rd. That's the last O. So we can do it in May. Like Marty said, we've waited as late as June to do a calendar. I mean, the board can decide that. We could wait, make sure we've covered every day before we come with an official. But I'd rather not decide tonight. Let, no, let the I'm not. I, work yeah, on it I mean, it's, it's we'll late. And to my colleagues, I wasn't wanting our general counsel or the superintendent to confirm tonight. I just, I did want to raise that as if, if we're not using, um, you know, attendance data, to, to help us decide among these 15, and we're trying to build a calendar um, process that that can incorporate this for the very next calendar year, I think we're gonna need to be, number one, having Superintendent Brabrand bring back to us his timeline, and we'll need to then deliberate with each other how far out can we push this and, and not upset our community. And I can't emphasize enough how much we've got to survey our entire community on any departure from our current practices. Thank you. Ms. Omesh? Uh, I was planning to speak on uh, the previous piece, I think, but um, what I will say is on this data piece, I, I think, you know, as a board, we have to really be intentional about this. There's already been conversation that some have resisted about collecting more expansive categories. It's great to see that folks are on the same page that data is useful, but we have a level of sophistication where we have an understanding that data is also limited and data only gives us what it literally gives us. So uh, with that in mind, if we're gonna do this in a way that you know, is intentional in advance of that, obviously we need more expansive and categories that we're collecting, that whether that be racial categories, whether that be languages, whether that be uh, you know, religious identification. And I know the conversation already started in governance. I hope folks can support it, seeing how important it is now. Um, and and you know, beyond that, I, I think there's something to be said about when we say we see a system, we see our kids by name and by need, but we don't even account for the information necessary to make proper decisions and don't recognize that the data could actually tell us things we may not even realize it will tell us because we don't have it. Um, so th that's just something I, you know, I offer as advocacy. Dr. Brabrand, this might be a great opportunity to actually start that process, given that you know, other areas are leading us in it anyway, um, to, to inform this. Um, and anyway, I have a lot to say about that, but I'll leave it at that for the time. Thank you. Um, seeing that there are no other speakers to this, I will take a quick turn. 
Um, honestly, friends, I'm struggling here a little bit in terms of this timetable uh, for some of the reasons that were just shared. I don't want us to rush into something and we are not able to deliver on this. I, I would like some more specificity regarding the data points that we can use outside of attendance information. Um, I would like to know what that data collection could look like, as Ms. Omesh has um, mentioned. I, I, I'm not sure at all. I'm not saying I'm against this because this is a process that I want to go into but the time is of concern to me, especially given what we know is on the agenda for us as a division, you know, with returning to school and some other things that we've discussed um, earlier. So I'm struggling here a little bit. Um, as I am the last speaker, I will now call for the vote. The motion is on the screen. All those in favor, please raise your hands at this time. We have Mr. Frisch, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Ms. Sizemore Heiser, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Pokarski, Ms. Marin, Ms. Omesh, Ms. Tolan, Ms. Darna Koufax. And that is eight. All of those against? None. All of those abstaining? Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Keys Gamara, and myself. Motion passes. Okay, at this point, we are up to the consent agenda, which I will gladly hand over to my colleague here, Ms. Pekarski. All right, consent agenda, our adopted rules of parliamentary procedure, Robert's rules provide for a consent agenda, listing several items for approval of the board by a single motion. Many items listed have gone through board review and documentation has been provided to all board members and the public in advance. Items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member prior to the meeting. The consent agenda items are on the screen. Are there any objections? Seeing and hearing none, consent agenda is approved. New business. The following are the new business agenda items. There will not be a vote on these tonight, but action is scheduled at a future meeting. New business items are on the screen. Thank you very much, Ms. Pekarski. Agenda item 7.01, Superintendent Matters. I will now turn the floor to Dr. Braybrand. Given the hour, I'm gonna take a pass on Superintendent Matters. I'll share them with you in writing later today. Thank you. Agenda item 8.01, Board Committee Reports. Mr. Frisch for an update from the Governance Committee. Thank you, I'll keep this to under 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, kidding. Um, Really quickly, uh, at our most recent meeting this month, the Governance Committee has been working with staff to address questions around policy 3310. Um, or, sorry, we've moved on to the full board to rescind policy 3310, the Focus Schools Initiative, which is no longer really used in our system. We've also submitted a number of questions for staff discussion at a future meeting around policy 5015, the procurement of professional and consultant services. Policy 5011, the authority to contract. Policy 2501, rules and procedures for school counseling services. Policy 2720, uh, which governs student lists. And that's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Frisch. At this point, we are up to agenda item 9.01, board matters. I call on Ms. Cohen. It's late. I know other people that would like to speak, but I'll, I'll pass until next time. Thank you. Ms. Corbett Sanders? Given the late hour, I too will pass. Thank you. Ms. Dana Koufax? I will also pass. Thank you. Mr. Frisch? I'll pass. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin? Ms. Marin? I'll just say I'm having a student town hall on Wednesday, March 24th. Um, find me on the internet to get more information. <laughs> Ms. Olmesh. Shout out to Megan Baldoff, who was my eighth grade English teacher and showed up earlier in the presentation as an accredited uh, a teacher. So that's all I wanted to say, but good night. Ms. Pekarski. Yeah, thank you uh, to Oak Hill Elementary and Franklin Middle School for having Dr. Braybrand and me out um, to visit them. Uh, we had a, a great visit and it was nice to see kids in classrooms. 
Ms. Tolan? Um, just very quickly, because it's timely, um, this week was virtual judging for the um, Regional Science and Engineering Fair. And um, I was thrilled to participate um, this week and to see some amazing projects done by students. And, um, you know, I participated in the Science Fair judging for many years. I'm always super impressed by the, um, the problem solving, the ingenuity, the creativity of our students. Um, the live stream awards ceremony will take place this Sunday, the 21st, from 3 to 4 on uh, Channel 99. So if you want to see some great student work, it's a, a great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Eismo Heiser? Um, I'm not going to share what I had written. I had actually written a, a pretty emotional speech for myself about autism awareness that I was hoping to give after the recognition, but um, it wasn't in the script. So I will not share it because of the late hour, but I will just ask one sentence and the resolution of recognition, and it's late, I apologize, ended with the phrase, building more inclusive experiences. And I would just challenge all of us that we need to go well beyond building inclusive experiences and instead create a culture where we include the lived norms of those with autism within the norms of our classroom and the norms of our school community and redefine disability as diversity. And there should no longer be about autism acceptance or awareness, but autism as part of the norms of our society. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Yes, briefly, I wanna thank again the schools that um, have allowed me to come in and visit and uh, drop into their classrooms, uh, see the cafeteria food, which I'll send a little memo <laughs> to the superintendent on. But uh, overall, I'm so, so grateful to our teachers and principals and staff who are really bringing back these students and, and all the kids I talked to in the cafeteria could not be more excited about being in person. And finally, since I didn't have time to say this, that. Uh, deeply appreciate the many members of the um, uh, JCRC who reached out to me and we spent countless hours talking about uh, the calendar, about their experiences and concerns. Uh, it is through having these conversations that we can better understand what people are going through and then how do we work collectively. Uh, but I do also know that any work we do here, we've got to as our very bright and smart um, student representative, Nathan Anabudo said earlier tonight, being careful and deliberative so we, do, we get it right. So have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Um, my turn. I will very quickly like to say thank you to Glasgow for allowing both myself and Ms. Seismo Heiser to participate in their um, lobby day that just took place. It was a fantastic experience. We're very proud of those students. It is now 1228 and good morning. Meeting is adjourned.